Welcome to my basement, everybody. I've got a great treat for you today. I have Mr. David Doak, who you know from Rare and also from Free Radical Designs. You may have heard of his name with a studio called Dam Buster as well. And we are going to be talking about all kinds of incredible things. And this is really a leaping off conversation based around the fact that in 1997, we previewed and reviewed a little game you might have heard of called GoldenEye 007, which David Doak worked on with a very small team in Rare at Rare and uh, helped to bring out into the world and worked very hard to deliver something incredibly entertaining, which I think is something that you can say about those early episodes of EP as well. We didn't know what we were doing, but we were building a show talking about how these incredible games were getting made. And it is my pleasure to welcome David Doak to Vic's Basement. We have met several times, I think, over the years at various things, E3 probably, but we've never done this, and I am so delighted <laughs> to have you here, David. How are you doing today? Great. It's great, it's great to be here, Vic. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, I guess it was kind of 25-plus years ago and, and, and a few a few years after that. Mostly we met kind of E3s, so o- yeah. over the time I was at Rare and then at Free Radical. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing seeing the old – um, electronic playgrounds coming you're, you're putting them back on 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 youtube and stuff and things um because it just seems like it seems like a, a hundred years ago i mean it was such <laughs> a different place the world of video games and entertainment then it seems like a hundred years ago and also yesterday and it, it's interesting mm-hmm. some of the feedback and some of the comments of course there's a lot of us lifers that reflect back on those days and <laughs> <Lifers>. games <laughs> You know, that have always loved video games and and they reflect it was simpler and people think it was better. And, you know, and everybody's has a right to their opinion and stuff. But, you know, the business just moves at such a quick pace. And so it's really easy to kind of get lost in time. And that's why we really wanted to celebrate these releases and just do them one a week. Let them kind of sit for a bit. I didn't want to just upload everything. I wanted to kind of re-examine this stuff and do things like this, reconnect with people mm-hmm. um, that we've met over the years. And and uh, we didn't have you in that first season of EP because I think what was happening with the first seasons of the show is that, you know, the industry was still kind of learning about how to have developers communicate about their craft to the press. And I, was that true for for you guys? Because w- most of our point of contact around Goldeneye was through Nintendo proper. We didn't yeah. get to Rare. We didn't really talk with your team and your people that were building this. Was that true back then? You just didn't have a lot of connection I, with the I, with the press. I guess I guess there's I mean there's there's probably two things at play there. One is just generally from a historical point of view, developers didn't didn't talk about things when they were making them, um, and mm. often didn't talk about them after they'd made them. Right. Um, you know. And that's, I mean, I guess that that really reflects just what kind of, you know, what broadcast media there was then, because it was really, I mean, the internet existed, um, but it wasn't a common source of information for people. Um, you yep. know, there were there were there were text based things on there. You get game reviews and stuff and things, but there certainly wasn't any kind of like um, AV media and stuff and things like that. Um, and and then the other side of it would be that, that Rare was always an incredibly secretive place. Right. Um, you know, the, the t- Tim and Chris, the Stamper brothers, they, even when they were ultimate play the game and they were doing the kind of like, you know, Spectrum C64 stuff back, back kind of, you know, in the, in the eighties, they, they, they had no kind of public facing thing, identity other than the games and the brand. I've um, never I met them. A, I've never met them at yeah, all. The E3, yeah. and I've been to all the E3s and covered Nintendo top to bottom and Xbox top to bottom, but I've never met the Stamper Brothers. And I guess that's it, uh, that's the way that they operated. It, it, it was a very deliberate choice. I mean, I, I, th- I think Tim often, if he was asked about it, he would say, "Well, you know, the games, the games speak for themselves. We don't need to speak for the games." Um, and I think they were. I mean, they were. They were probably quite shy guys from that point of view i mean that's what they that they, they'd grown into so yeah. you know at rare i mean again rare itself was i mean i or was my analogy is always it was like a, a, a willy wonka kind of setting you know there was a there was a gate and behind the gate there was a drive and there was a farmhouse and you don't see what goes in and you don't see what 
comes out. And then every now and again, these amazing products would be released and would just go internationally just to transform people's you know experience. That's amazing. I have to tell you something, David, and, and please pass this on to your uh, your brothers in arms and the people that you worked with at Rare on GoldenEye specifically, but I think it, it, the culture at Rare, like the games that were coming out of Rare uh, were just incredible. But I had a couple of really incredible things happen with the launch of an EP. You know, I used the PlayStation 1 coming into the marketplace as a vehicle to meet with broadcasters. And I would show them these real-time 3D games that were really radically different from the 16-bit pixel-based stuff that we'd been playing. And I'd show them that you could have control of these 3D characters and broadcasters' eyes kind of went, oh my God, it's mm -hmm. like you're able to play like these Pixar type, you know, 3D experiences in real time. But we launched in 1997, which was, of course, the year that GoldenEye came out. And it was absolutely uh, just this tailwind of eyeballs and awareness and people kind of cluing into the fact that this medium could be profoundly impactful and also could cross over in really substantial ways. And certainly up until that point, there had been this kind of dismissiveness in game culture around, mm. um, you know, licensed games and licensed properties. But GoldenEye changed the script, flipped the script. And the other big thing that happened for EP is when we went daily, it was in 2008 when it became like an entertainment magazine with its heart around video games. And that was when Iron Man was being released into popular culture and the MCU. And so we were having all of this behind the scenes stuff on Marvel and meeting Robert Downey Jr. And all of these things kind of worked to usher in, you know, a, a wider awareness of what was happening in video games. But I really credit GoldenEye. It was such a substantial enormous, culturally impactful property. Tomb Raider was huge too. There were other big titles, of course, but GoldenEye trans, you know, uh, it just went across the lines. And I, I, I'm wondering if you felt that working at Rare or if it was just on to the next thing with you guys. Well, it, I mean, it, it was it was incredibly important to everyone on the team because we, I mean, you know, as as been revealed subsequently. I mean, but that was the first game that almost all of us worked on. You know, we we yeah. all come to. I mean, we we were all games players. Um, I mean, Martin Hollis, who was team lead, had worked on Killer Instinct before, um, but mm -hmm. Goldmine was the first thing he was in charge of. And everyone else, it was their first. It was their first rodeo. <laughs> um, so, Wild. I mean, we were, and and I guess you know, in in terms of the kind of the team. And how we fitted into Rare, we were also we had been we we'd all been recruited to work on 3D games, um, right? Or, you know, or work on that generation. So um, we were all a little bit older than the average kind of um, person started at Rare, I guess. Um, and we'd come from various backgrounds. Now I came from a science background. Um, Martin and Mark were kind of like maths comp side kind of thing, and that was unusual. Um, Brett and Carl had been, I think, in Bournemouth doing kind of some of the first kind of tertiary, you know, digital art kind of degrees because that wasn't their thing um, right. at that at that time. That kind of career path. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't it for us. It was a kind of new beginning as well, right? Um, I think I mean it was interesting what you just said about about I mean I hadn't really thought about that kind of um, you know it was in some ways it was the, the kind of birth of the cool in games because they were yes. moving away from being I mean games were up until then video games were toys and yeah I, 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 th I thing I used to say to people was you know when they asked you what what you did I said well I work in video games um, but that's not something that you can have a after dinner conversation about. Right, you know, people people would talk about film, they talk about novels, they talk about music. You wouldn't have a dinner party where people talk about video games because it was just like that was kid stuff. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, you you mentioned PlayStation. I think PlayStation, Sony entering that arena was really important. I mean, certainly in the UK and mm -hmm. and Sony Europe, they definitely wanted to place games the playstation one games psx were 
being placed as a thing that appealed to an older audience. And there was a club culture thing, a lot of the advertising, mm -hmm. things like Wipeout is a very good example. I mean, that came a little bit later. Well, it was at launch, but um, the the score, the music side of it, you know, you could play, there was Prodigy tracks on Wipeout. There was this kind of EDM stuff going on. Um, and suddenly it was like, well, this is, and I guess that's the the wave that you rode with the early EPs was that this is a thing that broadcasters would be interested in because it could go as prime time. It wasn't niche anymore. Yes. It was, it was major stuff. Yeah. And that was the thing that I was always um, uh, in conversation with people about, right? Because there was this right from the beginning with television, there was this, this animosity, I think a little bit towards video games because video games replaced TV, you know, the yeah. television as a product just became a conduit to other entertainment that the game that uh, broadcasters mm -hmm. weren't really privy to. But I, I tried to explain that these were storytellers and this was the new way for people to communicate, not, not just about the experience, but also about the making of it and the culture around the making of it. And uh, thankfully people listened and it worked and we had a nice, very, very nice long run with lots of great partners uh, over the years. But your point about the dinner table conversation is what drives me today in 2024, because what I'm seeing is the absence of that. And there's been this relinquishing uh, and almost like a waving of the white flag from the video game publishing community to let um, uninformed people with good intentions, but people that are on the outside of things and uh, you, we need the fans, we need all of that stuff, but they are, they're kind of like they're, they're carrying the water about telling the stories about video games. And the games industry, mm -hmm. I think, has also retracted a little bit from the momentum it has had to allow people to let us know who's making these things and there was this great momentum prior to you know youtube and twitch kind of taking over when when documentaries were being made and all kinds of content was being made getting into the world of games and then suddenly there's been this reversion back to almost the fanzine type culture where we're well, the giving the, re the, re the reaction video <laughs> yeah, it's the reaction video. It's the simplest form of just and it's all product based. And so that's what's driven me, you know, my whole career. But over the last while is to connect with people like yourself and to have conversations and, and to humanize this a little bit, because I want people to be inspired to do this more. You know, I want I don't want them to be YouTubers. I want them to be game makers. I want people to see that, you know, it's not easy. And I know you have anecdotes about how difficult it was to build <laughs> GoldenEye and other games, but it, it you know, it, well, I think it's a beautiful medium. And I, I'm really curious to hear, you know, someone that's gone through massive hits and starting a studio and running teams mm -hmm. and seeing a studio close and building up brand new IP and going through all of the the hurdles and experiences that you have, how you feel about video games today. You know, and how how you feel about the medium and and its potential and and its opportunity for people today. It's interesting that I mean, talking about how you know games and kind of discourse about games, you know, did manage to break through to a certain level in the media. A, a, a anecdote, which is just from yesterday, actually. So my 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 younger daughter Daisy is just doing her A levels here. And um, and one of one of her subjects is English, and one of the um, one of the coursework things and exams she's doing is is, is about Gothic literature. Mm. And I picked up one of her textbooks the other day, which was um, it's an overview of what of what of what Gothic is in in literature. And the introduction, right. I thought I'll skim I'll skim this and see where it goes. You know, so you skim it, and I was skimming the introduction. And it talks about you know. Origins of Gothic literature, you know, Victorian Gothic, all that kind of stuff. And to its credit, the kind of preface to this book comes up to it goes through kind of like you know um, early twentieth century cinema. Come, it mentions um, Nightmare on Elm Street at one point. Gets up as far as some things like Twilight and stuff, and just touches on it, and doesn't mention video games anywhere at, at all. all. Yeah. And and I, and I said today, so you know, it's like you know that. You know, if I was, if someone was asking me for examples of modern Gothic, 
they'd all be video games. I mean, there'd right. be some, obviously there'd be some Netflix stuff and all that kind of streaming stuff. So, but there's a whole part of creative effort there, which is amazing mm-hmm. that you, you, you're you not touching on. And she said, well, with literature, I said, yeah, but it, you're you're happy for them. You know, it's like we, we were talking the other day and for, Forbidden Planet as as a interpretation of the Tempest is a thing that she's talking about somewhere else in, in, in some of the stuff she's doing. And she said, well, dad, people probably don't write about it. So I just went on Google. I said, you know, and came back to it because she really liked Edith Finch, you know, the Edith Finch game. Yeah. And immediately I found some academic stuff talking about it. And then we're looking at it. Well, but it's, it's a perfect example of Gothic. You know, it's got the family story. It's got the closed rooms. It's got this death stuff going on. You know, but I suspect that if she went and wrote in an essay about that it would be well that's a bit quirky still because it's right right but but she would stand out she would stand well that's why i I told you you should name name drop that and yeah (laughs) well i'll tell you what's what's been happening with me with with the archive that we have because we we shot and i i don't want to talk too much about me but this this will be the last thing for a little bit here but the uh the ep archive we shot over four thousand episodes and then we collected lots and lots of interviews that were lengthy like 15 20 minutes and they'd be cut down to three minutes in our tv show I've been having I've had these tapes and discs and things like that in my collection for a long time. And of course, we're all digital now. And so last year, I partnered with the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and they've got a game studies program that they have just Mm -hmm. launched. And so I donated our physical collection to them to digitize for their students to show off all of this, these interviews and these studio Mm -hmm. visits and all these things that that we uh, that we did over the years. And so there is this, I think. I mean, there is definitely a huge sector of the audience out there that has deep, deep respect. I mean, you just came back from the Game On Expo in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. What was that experience like for you to to meet, you know, lifelong well, that, fans of your work? Well, that 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 was brilliant. I mean, if I mean, I'm happy to have you want to jump into that because that was, you know, that's a thing that I'm doing now um, with. Um, with with some of my old colleagues from Rare, so David Wise, awesome. who wrote the Donkey Kong Country music, amongst others, Grant Kirkhope, who wrote uh, Gold, some of the Goldeneye music, well, half the Goldeneye yep. music, Banjo Kazooie, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Kevin Bayliss, who was art director at Rare, myself, um, and then a couple of other chaps, um, Phil Jordan and, and Nigel Atkins, who are guitarist and drummer, and it that kind of, I mean, I think for years. David has always been wanting to tour his music, mm-hmm. um, and I we'd, we'd connected a few times at, at, a, at a show at, at, in Norway that we've been doing the last few years, um, which is a fairly small show, but a very very friendly one with lots of you know retro gaming, lots of lots of fans and stuff. And um, what yeah, I, I mean to explain to your audience what that has now turned into is us if we go to with 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 we will go to a convention. We're not just going to do a panel and meet and greet and sign things and talk to people. We're going to perform the music live from, from their back catalog, which is, a, <laughs> That's awesome. which is basically, you know, you're, you're looking to work out what you're going to leave out because it's just, it's, it's, it's banging hit after banging hit really. That's and, great. Um, the, I mean that's an, another thread to this whole thing of what video games are, and it's it always amused me that they're called video games and there's no audio component to it. Yeah, is, yeah. Is that is is, is that the music has been transformative for many people through their lives? I mean, and and mm-hmm. one of the things about I mean, particularly in, in, in games when you play a game, you engage with the music a lot. I mean, the music is has been crafted and placed in the game to support the experience um and also particularly in the older games you would hear that you would play a level and you go through the you know you work to complete the level you play it many times you have the strife and the kind of overcoming the challenge and this music is is there all the time and it's just amazing how it touches people and how it's just and also the music has a component i mean we we you, you talk briefly earlier about how you know the challenge of making games one of the big challenges is the technology ramp you know mm-hmm. you're making something which is trying to 
we're traditionally we were making something which is trying to be at the, the pinnacle of the current tech for making games. And obviously when you wind on 20, 30 years, it looks old. Um, the music doesn't date at all. Even if the That's music was true. delivered, even if mm -hmm. the music was delivered through like sound chips, you know, eight bit SID chip or, you know, 80, it's the, the melodies and the structure of the music are still valid and you can transform them into another. So we can go and play, you know, like a kind of rock version or an EDM music, EDM version of, 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 of some of the Donkey Kong stuff. And it's immediately recognizable. So you have the resonance. And then also you just, I mean, I think another thing about that, which is, which is we're enjoying immensely. And I think the, the, the fans are enjoying immensely is that it's, it's in the moment you, you, you are with people you are in, we're enjoying performing the thing. They're enjoying listening to it, but it's a, it's a moment. I mean, you can watch, you know, you can watch obviously everything gets recorded now. So you'll be able to watch, you know, some YouTube videos with people, but it's, it's got that immediacy and an intimacy about it, which is, which is really good fun. And transportive. You know, I, I uh, played a little bit of the dam level from GoldenEye <laughs> and was, just before our chat today and was immediately struck by, and I know there are internet memes about this, but the music for GoldenEye is just yeah. incredible. Were you guys aware of, you know, the work and how, so, let's talk music here. Did you know how amazing the music was for GoldenEye? No, I, no, I don't. Because when I, when I was working on GoldenEye, it was all new. Every, everything was new to me about being in the studio, working on a game. Yeah. You know, I hadn't actually gone to Rare to make games. I'd gone there to be the system administrator for the Silicon Graphics Network. Right. Um, and and for various reasons, moved out of that in, 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 into making it. So I was just learning and learning and learning. Uh, but I kind of, I mean, I was really focused on my bit, which was trying to upskill and bring something to it. And you just kind of assumed that everything else was there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was like, yeah, well, Graham's, Graham's doing the sound effects and the sound design stuff. So that's there, the sound, and there's this music. So I, that's not that's not in my lane. So I don't need to worry about it. Right. And then and then later you realize, wait, wait, you you know, you had this amazing level of excellence going on, and you know, and but then you but know, Graham would come and ask, so what do you think about that gun sound? Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do you like the sound do you, do you like the sound on that that the, the track for that level well actually we've been turning it down when we were playing because we didn't play with you know you know you, right, you might, you might, you're testing you know, you it saying, yeah, yeah you're, you're you're playing putting stuff in you might not actually have the sound on because you know right. we we you know only occasionally you know you're in a shared office so if everyone's got the game blaring out at the same time um, you know, it would just be annoying for everyone. So you turn the sound down because you're not worried about the sound at that particular point in time. Graham Norgate always had this really, it was such a, a clever comment. It's like, he would always say, it's like, you know, if you go into the options on the game, there's an option to turn the sound down or off. So there's no option to turn the graphics off, is there? <laughs> why, 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 are we, why are we second why, why is our you know our, our, our work is something that you feel that there's a need to you know or turn the gameplay off turn the AR off <laughs> yeah hey you know I was at Nintendo Live last year and, and Nintendo asked me to um, host at the uh, they had a like a symphony orchestra playing Mario and Zelda music it was an amazing honor and of course everybody was moved I was moved I couldn't believe what I was hearing they should absolutely do a GoldenEye concert, but I imagine, like, just a nightmare in terms of like rights th and th issues and who yeah, owns what. Th and th and there have been there have been. I, mean, I know if you look online, there's there's a performance with a bunch of like a GoldenEye medley of stuff and things um, with 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 a with a full orchestra. That's um, amazing. I mean, but then, but then again, another thing with the music side of it, which I, I sort of watched a kind of like critical video about the other day which was again interesting it was saying mm. that um in the music world now 
in, in performance space. You know, it's, 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 it has kind of become a bit monolithic. You know, there's, there's Taylor Swift and there's all of this, and there's stadium arena stuff and things. Yeah. And then, you know, a, a lot of live music is now slightly under threat just due to the cost of staging and insurance and right. all that kind of stuff and things. Yeah. Um, but a really thriving thing is kind of um, like band-based covers, kind of slightly jazzy improvisational stuff around the music. Mm-hmm. And, and this video was saying that, that, that video game music is the new jazz standards. Totally. Because people... Because because pe- people know the music really really well, yes. But I think because they're used to having reinterpretations of it, where maybe the scoring is different because it's moved away from being played on the on the original hardware and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, they're, yeah. they're they're receptive to listening to a interpretation, as opposed to wanting to go hear a covers band just doggedly do something. Totally. Um, anyway, yeah, and that was another thing that happened in Phoenix, which was just. Great fun. We we had we were joined by um, by Shotty, who are this kind of like um, duo who do some game covers and stuff and things. Joined on, they, they kind of guested on a Diddy Kong track, and that That's was a really yeah, you know, it was a buzz for them, buzz for us. And we had Robbie. So you're jazzifying and improvising off yeah, of familiar yeah. music, all of it though, because it's live, right? I mean, that must feel amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. so well, cool. Just, what, just, so what just, do you play? I play bass. Oh, that's so, so that's cool! Only, and so that's only a thing I've been doing. I, I used to play. I, I played guitar kind of recreationally for years and years. Um, a couple of years ago, with some friends, um, a neighbor, uh, and, and and some local friends, I got involved in playing in a blues band, playing playing bass. Right um, on. And then and then and then, I guess it was twenty twenty three or twenty uh, beginning of twenty three. David said, "Oh, you know what? I'm 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 getting to go and and, and gig the music in in Chile at this." Um, the show there and i said do you need a bass player because i can play bass a bit now <laughs> that's awesome man did you guys ever do anything like that back in the day when you no, were did you no, ever jam no. or anything no 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 and and, no. and and i again i mean Dave, david wise i knew david um at rare because mm-hmm. i would occasionally go and bang my head under his desk sorting out cables and stuff for him when i was doing this but we never worked together on anything right so it was really only like kind of 20 years later we we kind of hooked up through being at cons together and mm-hmm. developed a friendship um so yeah so that that's all you know it's all kind of um <laughs> later it, life that, stuff <laughs> work you know i know that people that are watching and listening want me to get into each of the specific games that you worked on and we're going to do that but it must be surreal for you because you were in it and you you know, it's the same for me too. It's like, you can't really see what you're doing. Like you can't really know what this is all going to mean or all the twists and turns that this is going to be for your life. It it must be surreal to kind of reflect back on all that because you probably have this immediate callback to how difficult moments were and how much of a struggle it must've been to just finish these projects and get stuff published and, but now you have these lifelong friendships and all of these other different connections across all of this. Well, that's, I mean, I, I guess I mean, there's, there's kind of two threads there. One is, is, and you alluded to it yourself, is that when you're in the moment of, you know, you're making those shows, we were making the games, it, you, there isn't a moment to do anything else. It's just frantic, yeah. frantic, frantic. And, and also at that time, there was no attempt to document that process certainly right. rare you know yeah. and, and 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 even it's, it's funny I, I remember looking someone asked me the other day if i had any um pictures of, of free radical and i think i've got one picture of me wow in the studio which just happened to be someone took a polaroid for some other reason right um but there's 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 nothing i mean i can remember what it looked but it, you know but there's there's nothing um so there's that kind of part of it, which is that, you know, that you were so, you were, yeah, everyone was resource and time limited. So you were just doing that. So mm-hmm. you didn't really have any time to think about it. You certainly didn't think that the thing that you were creating had any kind of permanence to it because it was mm-hmm. a game. You were making something that would be out and it would sell for a couple of years and then it would be gone. 
So that was there was no idea, well, what are people going to think of this in 25 years' time? It's like, no, they're not. Um, and then and then jumping forward to today, um, it, I mean, it's just, it's... Now I kind of look back at that and think how... I mean, I think everyone who is successful ends up well if they if they're if they're a sane person they 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 realize you know yes you had to work hard yes you had to be talented but you also had to be incredibly incredibly lucky yeah to be in the place to be able to then push the levers to make a career so yeah. you know there's a there's a lot of kind of like you know thank being thankful for that privilege but now with say with the music stuff or the going just just being able to celebrate it and meet with people who yep. appreciate it. You know, you, you know, we were so lucky to be able to make things that went out into the world and touched people. And then to then like 20, 30 years later to have people come and say, you know, the thing you did changed my life. And you're kind yeah. of going, well, yeah, I want to thank you. And they kind of, but it's always the flip side of that is I want to thank you because you coming up to me and saying that something I did mattered to you is an incredibly affirming thing for me. Yeah. Um, so it's, and, and that, I think that's one of the things which overwhelmingly, if you, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, you see it yourself with, with, with conventions and stuff, they are such positive spaces. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 everyone is there to celebrate and enjoy and, and and they're really quite emotional, um, you know. And and, and, you know, and brother, like specific. the 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 death of E three is just so freaking tragic for that, you know. Because I I don't know how many of them you went to, but I went to lots of them, all of them. And what I found over time, as I was you know years into making this content and building these friendships across the industry, is like. I just wanted to see everybody, you know, and I would just run around hugging yeah. everybody and just like, yeah, this is yeah. amazing. Like we, we get so few chances in our busy lives to connect physically and, and like have a moment with people that we care about and are impressed by and, and are grateful for. And that's what things like E3 provided beyond all of its marketing footprint and all of the, all of the hype. But I, I love that this is a, a part of your world now and that you get this moment in the sun and you get this spotlight on you and the work and, and your colleagues as well, which must be a trip too, because, you know, of course you had to say goodbye to friends and make new ones when you left uh, Rare. Um, and I bet there's a, a thought like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to be too busy and I'm not going to see those people maybe ever again, but then you do, <laughs> right? <laughs> when we were in Phoenix, it was, it, it was, um, we, we, were, we were having a great time. We were, we, we were meeting people and we had basically our stand on the show floor was, you know, it was basically myself and, and Kevin and Dave and Grant. And Grant was, again, a great bunch of guys because there's a lot of messing around and taking the piss and stuff and things and 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 Grant we, we were like signing things. Grant, Grant kept on doing this to me. He'd, he'd lean over to me as I was signing. He said, "Yeah, yeah, they want you to sign." Like you know, you know when you left when you left Ray, you broke my heart. And he'd whisper that in my ear every time. It's going, and then he'd look at me and go. <laughs> um, okay well we're gonna get into we're gonna get into leaving rare let's talk about rare for a second here okay because i know that you started at rare and you had an intention you worked on donkey kong country 3 terrific game terrific franchise but not in not, not making the game or or how how did no, I, what did you I do was, on donkey kong country 3 i so i came to rare because well i mean i'd always Loved game. I never really thought I'd have a career in games. I was in. I was doing a postgraduate, uh, post doctorate actually at that stage in, in, in Oxford University. So I was a, a scientist. I worked in protein structure determination. So we you truly used, are Doctor Doke. I am. Yes, I have. I, I have. I have a doctorate. Yes, I'm. I'm That's Dr. amazing. Doke. That's uh, great. Yeah. Um, so I was as part of that. I was looking after silicon graphics workstations so mm. at the time so at the, at the time nobody had you know we take it completely for granted now nobody had 3d accelerated graphics yep. capabilities anywhere yeah yep. and, and 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 some of the places where they were used for these kind of high-end machines we use was in aerospace 
stuff and so aerospace simulators and design in the movie industry so jurassic park and all all all, all the the burgeoning um vfx digital vfx and in, industry um and then Silicon Graphics were also working with Nintendo because Nintendo were making a 3D console and SG made the hardware. And that meant that on the d- development side, a lot of the development machines were Silicon Graphics machines. So they were used for doing, I mean, and, and they had been used slightly before that. I mean, so that at Rare, all of the kind of the 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 the, 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 the beautiful rendered 3D sprites with the sprites, but they're rendered from 3D models that were in Donkey Kong Country, which was transformative for the mm-hmm. and, 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 and the kind of like SNES era. So that was all being done. So they had loads. Rare had loads of SG machines. Um, and they had an advert in Edge magazine, which is a UK kind of um, Love Edge. high-end video. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. It, it was, it, again, it's like when we talked about that, um, that kind of growing up of the culture. Edge was a glossy, aspirational magazine. It wasn't the kind of, um, you know, tra- not that's not, not not a fair thing to say, but, you know, just the, the kind of pulp magazine. It wasn't that an Edge magazine, you know, they expected you to keep them and line them up on your shelf with the with the spine showing and maybe buy a slip cover for them, all that kind of thing. Yeah, anyway. yeah. So Works I... About- I yeah, yeah. I mean, and very. I mean, the, the covers. You know, like, like heavy, heavy, heavy uh, card card covers with like gloss varnish and foil and everything like that. You know. Anyway, so I went to Rare to run their selling graphics network and just generally do system administration. So, like Donkey Kong Three, I'm on because I was doing because I helped them with some, you know, just run of the mill kind of sys admin stuff i used to i used to do a bit of testing in my spare time because we my office was up where the testers were so if they if they needed an extra pair of hands on something um like i remember a killer with a couple of times you just just can you just come and play this back play, play it like a person who didn't know what they're supposed to be doing would play a fighting <laughs> game just to check that we haven't got any you know someone just spamming it randomly is going to trigger attacks and stuff all the time um yeah, so that's what I went there to do. But then, I, I it, again, the Willy Wonka analogy, it was like being the guy who works at Willy Wonka's chocolate factory who changes the fuses. <laughs> that's great. So it was like... Every, but you, you, I, I think everybody w- m- had an important position, though, right? Like yeah, yeah, when you're yeah, that yeah. small... Yeah. You, and it, I'm sure there yeah, were lots of all hands stuff. on deck. Yeah, but, but right? it was kind of yeah. You know, but but you had this thing where there was the dev teams at Rare, and they were all in separate barns, um, kind of isolated. Well, not I mean, not isolated, but you didn't generally walk between places. So I, I, I simultaneously had had this incredible privilege, which was I could go anywhere. Right. If somebody if somebody needed something done, I would just go. So you know, my key opened all of the barn doors at Rare at that point. Um. So that was amazing. That's a rare position at the company. Yeah, it was that, a rare you know, position. And, and it was probably training you to, you know, maybe you weren't aware of it at the time, but to think holistically about how a whole studio can operate and yeah, yeah, you know, I, giving I, you the yeah, stepping I, stones to doing that. True, true. That That's 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 a, a good point. But also it was you were kind of on the other side of the glass because you weren't in the team. I'm sure. So you were watching you know, watching these people doing amazing things. And kind of, and I think also over the first few months, I was there, one of the things that kind of, you know, the penny was dropping. It was like, well, what, I, I could do that. I mean, my my opinions about these games are seem to be as valid as anyone else's because I can talk to people about what they're doing. Right. And, they're, you know, and, and, and you know, I... I have got some domain expertise just through being a fan and 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 liking games. Um, so I was going to leave because I kind of it was frustrating. Mm. In, 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 you in wanted to get ways. your hands on development, yeah. yeah. And and yeah. And, I, and and some friends had kind of offered me uh, positions overseas in in, in um, going back into science, um, and and then. Martin Hollis and then Simon Farmer, who was then studio manager at Rare, kind of got wind of the fact that I was thinking of leaving. And they're saying, "Well, what? Why? Why would you leave?" And I said, "Well, I'd, I'd love to work in a game." And Martin said, "Well, you can come and work in Goldeneye." 
<laughs> Amazing. We'll, we'll work. We'll we'll work out later what it is you're supposed to be doing. But <laughs> I'm sure there's something we can find you to do. Well, it, you know, I've, I I checked out your Moby Games credit, and I, I Moby Games is really terrific. Yeah, you know, I really like that. Uh, there's that much data on team names. I know it's not always perfect, but I just love that it's there for the games industry. Um, and you're you're listed as screenplay on Goldeneye, and I know that that is not the totality of everything that you did mm-hmm. there, but also writing in video games in the mid '90s, not really a thing. There, you know, little bits and pieces, maybe some RPGs, maybe, you know, some Black Isle stuff or something. Um, I'm sure Amy was doing quite a bit of writing over Crystal Dynamics and stuff. I think she might have been at EA back then. Yeah. But the the idea that you were, a, you know, writing the screenplay, it, talk, talk to us a little bit about that. You were actually deconstructing the yes. film and kind well, of making it more game. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, the credit for the beginning part of that i mean again everyone on the team was doing different things and sure. doing multiple things and mm-hmm. i mean Dun- duncan botwood was the original designer on goldeneye and duncan did a lot of work in i mean you know the the, the game follows the film but in some ways it doesn't follow the film because it has levels which are not in the film so it's like filling in story yeah so like the, the silo you know the silo for instance the silo is filling in the backstory of Urimov and stuff, and it's not in, you know, and Bond, you know, and, and then we have the Sevenaya is split between these two times. So Bond went there when it was under construction and then somehow went there again later, which is the film part of it. So this, it, it plays around with that. So there's, yeah, there was, there was, there was a strong and clever framework had been built for that. Um, but then the development. Prior to when I when I came to Goldeneye, yeah, a, a bunch of the levels had been built. The core gameplay work, the shooting and the first person stuff, and the AI was there to some extent. Um, I mean, Mark Edmonds was kind of gameplay and tools programmer. I mean, wore many hats, but I mean, the AI system that he he built was was had incredibly forward thinking foundations because people weren't really thinking about AI in that way at the time. Yeah, yeah. So we were setting up, and we used to call it again. We used to call it setup, level setup. You know, all all every level in the game had a, a setup file, which basically was the data for where everyone was and where all the items were and all that kind of stuff. So, and it was kind of, I guess, a, its simplest form. It was like set dressing the level. So the, the, mm-hmm. the graphics would have been built by you know Carl or Brett, um, Haley Smith. Um, so the level existed, and then it was like, okay, well, it's got, we've got a paragraph in a document somewhere. And it's funny, I never saw the game design document for Goldeneye until about 10 years after the game. <laughs> it, that shows you Whoops. the importance we, we, we placed on game design documents. Yeah. But, but it, you know, it had to echo the film in some cases or echo an idea for a level. Um. But we didn't actually have a recipe for how we would do that. So, I mean, for instance, the, I mean, the 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 facility is is, is a really good example because it, it had it presented a number of problems. Um, so, yeah, that's in the film, and so yeah, there's a dam first of all, and then he goes down, pit on gun, comes in into the toilet. So that had been built out that there's a toilet and there's some corridors and there's some gas plants and then there's that room at the end. But there was no idea of how we would tell the story. Mm -hmm. So things like um, objectives, things like the kind of pacing of the setup, patrolling guards, all that kind of stuff, those were all kind of just, you know, well, maybe we should have patrolling NPC scientists who don't do anything, who are, who are non-hostile. So that was then that get put in the AI. That's that that level has at the end of it has this fairly complicated, certainly by the day's standard, set piece. But it's interactive in some way. You go in, you meet Trevelyan. It's like you know, before those kind of things that we were doing, Goldeneye and, and some other some you know other other companies were moving in the same direction. I mean in in, in 
a first person shooter, that's what you did. You had a first person camera and you shot things. You just blasted was, away. Yeah. So your only way of interacting with the world was to shoot. So the only, you know, it's like when 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 the only tool you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. So when the only tool you have is a gun, everything is a target. And that's what you would do. And there was no other thing to do. The idea of meeting with someone or having a conversation or unfolding a story beat was was completely alien. Totally. So we had to develop. And I mean, that's that's one of the amazing things about particularly that period of time, kind of the the 90s and that generation that that you know the, the the move to 3d was one thing i mean the move to 3d was insane because that just it completely transformed you know it's two different prior, industries prior, prior, prior to prior to that you have yes. a you have a page and you have a camera looking at a page and you move the page around yes you don't go what's behind the page or you don't go and look over there yeah so suddenly that and and that's like it's a step change in complexity and there's no there's no there's no established protocol or vocabulary or systems for doing it camera control what what's camera control the I know. player never had to look after the camera yeah and and you see it, you see it i mean it's it you, you know, the n64 controller it's got those four little yellow buttons well they they're the camera control buttons yeah, I and mean, that's 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 what they were, and and it's it's very obvious in Mario, in Mario sixty four, that actually is explained to you in the tutorial part of the game. You've got little like you on the on the thing. There's a little guy holding. Here's the, this is the camera. Yeah, you're going to need to be worrying about what that's doing, and then obviously as time went on, people you know that 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 didn't have to be something that you had to explain because it was just it was that's how the games were and 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 the sophistication of camera control and how it becomes more yeah the the ease of use and there's less friction in it and let, all that kind of anyway that's that's another but and and but that's ha that's happening at the same time as the graphics complexity is changing because you've got to build these 3d environments at the same time as people are going well maybe a game just isn't running and jumping or shooting Maybe mm -hmm. there's another component to it. So you've got this, it's it's like the Wild West. You've just got this explosion of opportunity and space. And people, I mean, I I, I love looking back. I, I think in particular on PlayStation, because there were, there were probably more titles on PlayStation. Yeah. If you look at those early just forays in, in completely different directions, like Jumping Flash. Amazing. What? what Where'd that come from? You know, yeah, yeah, and 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 then when you start getting like Metal Gear, obviously, but there were other things like Metal Gear, like Siphon Filter and stuff, and things which were just going off and doing their own wild and wacky thing. Um, and in some ways, I mean, it's a shame because the main you know, that that was the mainstream at the time, and and kind of what you've seen now is is you know because of the budgets and stuff with AAA, you you know, people don't make wacky experimental AAA games anymore because they right. can't justify the expenditure on it. That that space, however, that kind of creative itch is often fulfilled by a lot of indie stuff now, where you get more. Yeah, stuff. Alan Wake Two last year was was a great uh, return to that experimental yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, that expensive experimental stuff. But everything that you guys were doing back then was exp expensive yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in relatively. And I think also because it was brand new technology and a brand new kind of way to think about video games that allowed you to be a perfect candidate to kind of enter the business. And I would imagine even at Rare, because there were a lot of 2D specialists, did you see colleagues kind of, you know, say that tap out and say, that's enough. I can't do this 3D stuff. No, I'm no, out of I here. I, 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 well, I, I, I think, I, I guess one of, one of the team, I mean, I, I, it wasn't that they, they tapped out. I think I think that for the people who had worked on the Donkey Kong series of games, yeah. the, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm sure there was a little bit of oh, we're going to jump over it. We're really we're super familiar and super happy with this space that we're in. Yes. Um, so kind of it's, it's interesting because they it was only really kind of banjo, I guess, was by the time because that 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 team first of all went through the. 
the the project dream which was ultimately just yeah, well not not can but it kind of morphed into banjo the stuff that i'm most proud of in games that i've worked on has been the has been the narrative stuff the storytelling finding a space for doing storytelling in games has been a thing that has evolved enormously over the time it's like a stealth thing you're trying to entertain the player at the same time as you're kind of like trying to push the buttons and get the information in there and yeah. get the reveals and get the prefiguring of stuff and all that kind of thing. Yeah, there's um, a UI component to it. I, I feel like narrative is a bit of a misnomer or, or even mm-hmm. storytelling. Like it's it's not really that in games because you're kind of story designing at the same time, right? You're yeah. having to have this dialogue with the, you know, the people that are working on engine and level design and game design elements to support it and to work collaboratively so that the story doesn't interfere with the play. And that's such a tricky thing to do, you know? And I think one of the great things about the storytelling and the design of GoldenEye, and I don't know if you were a part of some of these decisions, but was uh, taking a look at changing objectives based on the difficulty that you chose and the mission or the agent sort of level that you wanted to be at the beginning. Brilliant stuff. And I still remember Ken explaining that to me, Ken Lobb at Nintendo explaining that to me and my mind was blown. And that that came about by a, a strange route because we had the levels mm-hmm. built or levels being built. And we had this, and we had that, the, the, the dilemma I described earlier, it's like, well, you just, you start here and you got to get to there. That's the end. And then you just shoot people in between. Yeah. What else do you get to do that is interesting and provides variety? So we just, we, basically took every level and we would just brainstorm as many things as we could think of. That's cool. For you to do. And then there's obviously, you know, you know, there'll be things which are not possible. Like the film has a lot of driving in it and, and, you know, we at times were toying with the idea that you'd be able to drive some things like the, like the truck at the start um, of, of the dam, like, um, in in in, in St. Petersburg, there's there's Or Oromov's car is sort of driving off and things. I mean, the, the 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 one bit of driving that you had to do was the tank because the tank yeah. was pivotal in the movie. I mean, it's in all of all the publicity stuff and the trailers for the movie would have that that tank careering through St. Petersburg. And in Golden Knight, it's kind of funny because basically you just it's you just wear a tank costume and pretend you're yeah. a tank. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a tank now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 every once in a while, I catch myself realizing that's how they're doing vehicles yeah. or horses and stuff in games. It's like hey, you're, you're just speeding up the streaming, is what you're doing right now. That's cool, yeah. though. Um, but anyway, so we we made up all these things, and there's loads. I mean, there's loads of things where a, a favorite example of mine is because I can remember the day. I just remember doing it because it was like we we just had this keys keys you know partitioning levels with keys is a thing that you do we have locked doors yeah. we have keys yeah right yeah in, in in doom the keys are explicitly red blue uh yellow cards yeah so that yeah those doors so we can't do that we need to do something and and then things like so like the dr doke thing dr doke in the facility is a key it's just you go here if you go over here and do this it's just you're you're picking up the key and then the key opens the door on the dam that you go onto the dam, it's got that gate with a padlock on it. You shoot. I remember just just being there saying, "Oh, well, what can we do to make this more interesting?" And then said, Mark, "Mark, could we have it so that destroying a prop is linked to a door being unlocked?" Yeah, yeah, that's easy. Well, can we do it where the prop is? You know, and then Carl builds a lock, and you put the lock on it, and you shoot the lock. And it's like, oh, you can shoot the lock, and then and then. And then that becomes a thing because people hadn't seen it before. So then when they totally, play the game, man. Oh, it's amazing. You come up. It doesn't tell you what to do. There's a lock on the door. I've got a gun. Yeah, because you've got that, that's your hammer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or the breaking out of the train where it's got, it's got we, we've got, you know, on the floor, we've got like 50 of these little props, which you just have to laser with the laser. Like you're lasering now. Well, not. It's actually, it's just a different kind of gun shooting a different kind of thing, doing the same thing. And anyway, yeah. all the collection stuff, all the so we had all these things, and it was like we had this. We need to every level needs to have like five or six things you can do 
Um, I remember Martin, it was kind of about the same time as when Mario was coming out. Mario was saying, well, Mario's got those, if you go to the Mario level, you, know, you can collect the gold stars, you can collect the red stars, you can go, and, there's a whole right. bunch of things you can do. Yes, so yes. we need to have things you can do. So we had all these things. And also the game, um, another thing that happens when you make games is you, it, it's everyone falls into the same thing. You always make it too difficult. So we yeah. would just gradually, as we got better at playing the game, we would make it more difficult and make it more difficult. So you come to, and, and we just had this, I think it was kind of, it might even, I can't remember whether Ken was over when it happened or it was kind of like simultaneous with all that, but we were there because Ken was always kind of like, you know, he'd be sparking ideas as well. But we just had this thing, it's like, if we're making it easy, we've got the other levels, why do we take out some of these other things that we put in to make it simpler? So we came at that from completely the other end. We came at that, we came at that problem from the lens of, oh, no, there's nothing interesting to do in the game, so let's make up loads of things to do. And then it's like, yeah, but it's too complicated now. Yeah. Okay, so we take. So then when people come to it the other way around, they go, oh, you play the game, and it's like you do two or three things, and then the next difficulty, there's a whole world of new things to it do. It changes the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. Fine, blown. Yeah. And like the dad, yeah. the, I mean, the, the dam, for instance, you know, the, the first level on the game, you know, like famously now, when you see the speed runs of it, if you play that on the uh, the uh, uh, agent difficulty, it's just it's like a sprint. You just run, <laughs> you start there, <laughs> and you run down there, and you run as diagonally as you can, looking at the floor, and shooting as few people as possible, get through there, and then you go off the end. And it's like you know, it's 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 seconds of gameplay, <laughs> and there's a whole world that was built under the dam, all these things. You, know, you just, it's just off your radar. You're not interested because in the film and it's, it's, it's weird because it, it, looking back on it, you know, I, I could say, you know, I, I, I could, I could lie to you and say, you know what? We sat around in a meeting room and thought, you know, how do we, how do we encapsulate the fact that that part, first level really is the pre-title sequence? How do we yeah. distill it down to something so short that it gives you that same experience? That's not how we did it. We, we, the, the the thing with the dam was the dam was built and the the, the, the biggest nightmare with the dam was we couldn't it it, it wouldn't render at, it was you know it, it was too big and complicated an environment to to right. run in memory yeah um anyway but yeah but you have that thing with this unfolding objectives and it's it's the thing that yeah if people talk about the single player that is always a thing that comes it's like that blew my mind that you played that it. That was did. amazing. Well, and, and the dam level specifically, I think, is a great underline of embellishing what we see on screen and really adding context to it. It's almost yeah. like you're, you know, years ago I read, I don't know if you really wrote it, but years ago I read the George Lucas novelization of A New Hope of the first Star Wars movie. And to get all of the context for subtle decisions on screen and all that. And it just filled it all out. And so when you re-see a movie... You've got mm -hmm. all of these beautiful colors and details that weren't there the first time that you see it. One of the really cool things about the GoldenEye game property, of course, that was tied to the GoldenEye film, which has absolutely stood the test of time. It's one of my favorite Bond movies. I think it's one of the best Bond movies, definitely Brosnan's best one. I, I'm curious what it was like to build the game at, from a UK perspective. And, and sort of the importance culturally, I think, that Bond has as this international property. But, you know, he's so profoundly mm -hmm. based out of uh, out of the UK and what it was like to shepherd that and to work with the movie producers to to build the game. The funny side of that is that I think on the movie side, they didn't care because mm. they didn't have any expectation of it being anything of quality or relevance other than it was, you know, they probably they, they probably spent more care on checking what the James Bond lunchboxes that were being made were, you know, that they were adhering to, you know, wow. you know, because because at that time, I mean, that's another, you know, another thing that kind of Goldeneye almost did in passing was it completely raised the bar for what people's expectations of what a kind of movie licensed product game product would look like right um and 
I think on our side, exactly as you say, we were all of a generation who had grown up with James Bond and it's, it's, you know, James Bond was as relevant to kids as Harry Potter is now. Yes. You know, and, 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 and also I think another thing is in the days before, again, it's a, a, dif- a difficult thing to explain to um, kind of millennials and beyond that the idea that you didn't have choice over what your entertainment was. It's like you watch what was on the TV um, right. And, you know, and I mean, you might go and see things in the cinema, but things like the Bond films, certainly for, for me, and I, I know this was shared with a, a lot of the other team members, you know, we remembered that, you know, in, in the UK, there were like three um, terrestrial stations, two mm-hmm. BBC stations and, and, and ITV, independent television. And you watched the films that were on, their schedule and every kind of holiday like Christmas, there would be, they, they'd up their game. They'd always have, you know, higher value things to see. And there was always a bond movie. It was, you yeah. know, there was always the things that they would rerun things. There was in, on, 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 in the morning over Christmas, they would do a thing that you get a whole bunch of, that I to remember like, like kind of like Frank Capra movies and stuff in the morning, black and white ones in the morning, and 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 then they would the old Flash Gordon serials and stuff and things like that. They would they would all do that That's as part great. of that kind of, because all the kids were off, right? Yeah, kid kids were off, so you, so you get a whole bunch of special Christmas entertainment because there was like two weeks period when 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 you know there was there were, there were more 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 kids watching TV, and then you would get like maybe on Christmas Eve or the kind of you know. There would be that the 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 movie that they had secured that time, and it was often Bond, and and I, and that's the only time you got to watch that. It's you know it's like like Goldfinger. I mean, Goldfinger is one of my favourite Bond films, and I probably got the opportunity to watch it once every two or three years when I was right. little, and it was really really special. And then you would have your little DB five Corgi toy, and yeah, so got I've got one of those. So I think. From so, the so 60s. Our, <laughs> yeah. I would say our, our team, we were all, we loved the source material. You know, we'd grown up with it. And it was just this insane thing where we'd somehow been given custodianship of it in this in this game. And we were absolutely going to do our best to get it right. But nobody was checking. It was no, all up nobody, to you guys. Yeah, there was no. I don't remember there being any approval process at all. Wild. Um, the one thing that did happen was at late in the development. So, and also the the kind of um, you know, the parts of the the, the kind of multi multitude of companies who were involved with the Bond IP. You know, there's Eon, Danjack. MGM, I think at the time, there's all kinds of weird licensing and stuff going on. It was only um, quite late. I, I, I remember when it was because I was at the time, the day that they came, I was setting up, <laughs> setting up um, the as not the Aztec level, the, the 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 temple level. So that was again, we decided. That that was largely down to I think probably Brett and 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 Martin early on going. We were allowed to use anything in the Bond universe. For some reason, I don't know what happened there. Yeah, that was that was the deal that Nintendo had got whenever they signed up for this. So we we had a, like a shopping list of you know like Mayday and Jaws and Baron Samdi and and Odd Job, Odd so job. From other other movies. So we had Baron Samdi, and it was like, well, he needs to be a kind of a boss. And we had this Egypt level. So there was this. So, so all the main levels are being being done. That the, the, those two levels, the Egypt and the Aztec, were set up really late because it didn't matter if they didn't get done; they could be cut. Um, so I was doing that and these guys in suits came around because they were, I think with MGM and they were there just to check what the process of the thing was and what it looked like. And, um, and I remember the, 
them, them coming and they were going, wow, well, yeah. And I think they were just surprised because it wasn't, I mean, presumably they'd had some exposure to what we were doing somewhere. Somebody must have shown them a video or something at some point. But, you know, I was saying, I was explaining, it's like, well, it's Baron Samdi and, and and the thing I'm setting up here is you kill him. You know, the, 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 the shtick in this level is you kill him multiple times because he, he, he he's, a, he's a voodoo priest, so he can come back. And then at the end of the level, when you think you've killed him the last time, we're doing this cutscene where he comes up and he laughs and, you know, you get to see that he's still, that he's still alive and it's a kind of like, you know, and then it's going, oh, okay. And, and it was... The, but you could just see it's like we didn't think. Well, why are these people doing? These two people are kind of like making some interactive movie here. What's going on? What, what, who, you know. They're going off. <laughs> They're going off. They're going off on one. So I was and 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 I remember the, 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 the I can't remember the name of the guy, but he just going, okay, yeah, that's really good. So yeah, well, yeah, we like we like yeah, we we know the movies. We we like we like the stuff. That's great. Um, and then I think. But then the feedback later was okay. It's too violent, <laughs> right? It's James Bond, an assassin it, with a license to kill. Too it's violent. Too, it's, it's too violent. And um, why has it got all these bonds in it? Why, yeah. why has it got Roger? Why, when Roger Moore is. I, I think the way they, the thing I remember is that i can't remember where i heard this line but the impression i got was that their big concern was sean connery would want money right and when the other ones found out sean connery wanted and <laughs> was getting money that. they'd want money. hey i want some money too <laughs> and, I, and i wonder if it's because sean connery's contract probably predated the actual advent of video games so you know when you get these contracts now which is when you sign releases it's released for it, any Forever. all of these yes. media and any yeah. media that might come to exist in the next five million years or longer yeah. that hasn't been invented hasn't even been thought of yet. Um, so that that might anyway that's that speculation. Uh, that's so wild. That's so you about. had all the bonds in, but you had to cut them all yeah. out. That's yeah. crazy. So, and, and 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 Brett Brett I mean Brett had lovingly gone because it was the other thing in order to in order to get the textures for the texture mapping so you had to go and trawl through a whole bunch of stuff to find i mean i think some of them were like scanned from books and stuff and magazines and things like that right because it wasn't just google it up and you got all every angle of these actors back then that's amazing and and the and the violence thing was was interesting because we were trying to make it as realistic as we possibly could and again another another thing which was massively innovative at the time was motion capture Right, you know, so Duncan, and and again, you just you see there. I mean, the whole fact you've got a small team; it's everyone mm-hmm. is a jack of all trades. Duncan yeah. was the motion capture actor, no training whatsoever. He just, yeah, you know, and 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 Brett was the director. And, and you had a, 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 a mocap suite rated right rare. No, well, they, they they there was there was yeah there was I I, I think they may have gone off site for some of it, but there, it was it was again the the technology was dreadful. Yeah. So early motion capture, there was a thing called flock of birds, which was lovingly called crock of, <laughs> <laughs> which was basically a magnetic thing. So you had this suit, which had a whole bunch of it. It, it, it didn't. It didn't optically track things. It tracked. It, it had. It tracked ma- movement of magnetic in a magnetic field. It had some. I think it had some flex sensors and stuff. But it was yeah. like a, a neoprene suit with wires all over it and this big umbilical cord and that was because they, they tried to they, they tried to use that for some of the motion capture for killer it's like yeah but i mean how 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 do you do a roundhouse kick when you've got a, all of that stuff on right these cables yeah. coming out of you and stuff and things um anyway so that was the other thing so and 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 that was i think that was one of the things that we did dial back on there was some you know so some some of those animations where you know it's like man gets shot in the groin and then rolls around on floor clearly in agony for thirty seconds. It's like, well, maybe we should make that a bit shorter because it's kind of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, okay, this is going to be the last Bond question because I know we could just go on Bond forever. But um, of course, we're about to get a new Bond. We're about to be mm. see a new James Bond. Um, do you have a favorite of the James Bonds? And I guess a part B is, is there another actor that you're, you think should be James Bond that you've been thinking about? 
so I mean for me James Bond is Connery and yeah. that's that's it and and the other guys are the ones that they had when they didn't have Connery <laughs> and and then and then and then Brosnan I mean I've kind of Rod, I've warmed considerably to Roger Moore over the years because I again that whole yeah you know, the, the the comedy aspect of the Roger Moore stuff is 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 very well played you know it, it's kind of the, the innuendo and stuff is 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 done really playfully and I mean probably it would get you cancelled these days but it's it, it's there and yeah and, and it's a very it, it's it's a it's a, a lovely English quirkiness to the whole character yeah um and and Brosnan, I think, I mean, Brosnan to me, particularly in Goldeneye, was kind of like reincarnate Connery. It's just, yep. it's, it's, he's yep. just managing to hit exactly the same kind of levels of performance and stuff. And, so and suave subsequent... and rough at the same time, right? Like yeah, just yeah. a, yeah, yeah, ter- yeah, yeah terrific. Yeah. I casting. mean, goes, yeah, just, you I mean, just goes from like, you know, when, when, and uh, again, I think the the way they, I mean, certainly in that movie, the, the 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 nature of the kind of the Monaco scene and stuff in it with the casino and things, it's it's they're just like recapitulating all the little highlights of Bond, you know. Here's and here's the DB5 making a cameo, and it's all this. It was great, um, yeah. And and to be honest, I kind of after Golden, I kind of lost interest in James Bond. Yeah, I guess I, right. And, you were in and, the and fire, think, man. <laughs> and I wonder, I wonder if it is because we were just, we just said we've just we've we've bonded out. We've just spent <laughs> spent three years just yes. hit this close, thinking about it constantly, watching the movies yes. over and over again. Yeah, and you I deconstructed think, I mean, the magic. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, and again, that's why I mean, that's that's kind of why Perfect Dark went on the trajectory it did because we didn't, you know, we were being asked if we wanted to do the next, you know, Tomorrow Never Dies, or whatever. The, the of course, you would have been and right, and, yeah. And, and and the team were just going, we, we've kind of done enough Bond, um, yeah. And 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 it's also it's like, you, you know, that's a that's a difficult second album to do anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cinematically, it turned out as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and same with uh, Daniel Craig. Like he just never got back to Casino Royale Heights yeah. as well. And Martin uh, Campbell directed both Casino Royale and Goldeneye, and they're two of the best yeah. out there. Uh, oh, well, let's let's move to Perfect Dark then. And uh, did your role change at Rare? Did it did it shift? Did you have more responsibilities? Did the team grow? I mean, the hype now was real yeah like you guys delivered everybody was expecting something massive and and special and unique with perfect dark so yeah so when that was and again looking back on it i mean that you know the 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 the, the, the i mean i guess we'd we'd earned our stripes but the privilege was amazing it's like yeah what you we we you know what do you want to do next Oh well, we'll make a sequel. We like making shooters. We but there's a whole bunch of stuff we want to do, and then yeah, we'll do. We'll just we'll just write a story for it, and we'll just make up a new, completely new IP. Oh, by the way, we can we we'd like the main characters be to be female, and you just got you know people going. I mean that that was looking back. I mean I I, I have two I have two daughters now, um, Molly and Daisy. They're kind of like eighteen, twenty one now, um, and. It's kind of a matter of of personal pride that we stood up for saying why can why can't we have a female character? Because right. I mean, immediately it was like, yeah, but only only boys. But you know, all these get the the, the the boys the boys yeah. games. It's like, but yeah, but if you look at any other kind of fiction, there's lots of lead female characters. And and we were particularly, I mean, the Perfect Dark. I mean, Martin and I were both big fans of um, La Femme Nikita. The kind of um, yep. film and a big influence on me was there's a there's a Heinlein novel called Friday about this mm-hmm. kind of like assassin. It's a female character, and and I think also with Joanna Dark, we wanted it to be a credible female character, so we definitely pushed against any kind of overt sexualization of it. Yeah, um, and I think that stands up really well in in in, in the game. You know, it's it's like. You know the, 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 that that element isn't there, and 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 it's lovely how there's that one thing where she goes with the with with, with Carrington. She w- wears wears the evening dress for one of the you know again that's Brett doing some brilliant costume design, um, but it's 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 not. I mean, 
I, I love Lara, but it's not what Lara was. I mean, Lara then was, here's a character. Here's the bits you look at. I mean, we weren't yeah. doing that. Um, yeah. And, and well, also Toby because Gard first was quite upfront about some yeah. of the yeah. design choices on, on Lara yeah. Croft as well. And you're right. There isn't, I mean, she was a sexy protagonist, but maybe not sexualized anywhere near the same way that, that yeah, Laura Croft no, she was. was yeah, it, yeah. yeah it, was, it, was, it was cool. I mean, you know, yeah. cool and, and, and credible. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I mean, there was, I guess we had the structure where she's kind of like Carrington's protege in the, in, 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 in the world, in the world. But, yeah. you know, she's, um, and also the, you know, the Cassandra de Vries character. So we've got a, you know, but again, that's, I suppose part of that is coming. I mean, there's the Bond thing as well of having, you know, you often get, um, you know, a key kind of um, villain, female, female glam villain or powerful. Totally. Villain in, in, yeah. And the best anyway, yeah. females in Bond are incredibly competent peers mm -hmm. to James Bond, yeah. you know? Like, uh, yeah. Was it a different rare when you made Perfect Dark? Did you have more autonomy and more respect? I know there was a crunch culture with with Goldeneye and it burned out you guys. You know, I read the uh, the Fantastic Guardian article uh, from a couple of years ago where uh, the uh, the writer was asking all of you guys questions, and there was it was a tumultuous time to get that game out there. Was it yeah, a but, different kind of experience when you when you started Perfect Dark? I mean, the cr crunch is it's. It, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a complete. Every everyone, all of us looking back on that time, we wouldn't have made the games to the standard that they were made without crunch because we didn't have the time or resources to go about yes. it in a kind of like three day week. <laughs> yeah, you were paving the road as you were building the art. It was That's all right. of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I an analogy I I used to give to people is it, it's like being in a car race where you're actually building the engine as you go around and you, and, and, and you and you come around and people see you coming around and you wave to the stand and they see the car going past but they don't realize that someone's changing the wheel on the other side of the car just to keep it <laughs> to keep it on the road yeah um, and I I don't know I mean everyone has got I mean I it, it, I think the thing about the crunch stuff is enforced crunch is a it's a dreadful practice but every creative industry people get i think it, it, it it's a dangerous drug because if you if you create and you're doing that kind of thing you always want to make things the best they are so you just go i'll just do a little bit more i'll stay a bit longer i'll do this yeah. and then yeah. if you're in a team and it's a, a cohesive team then people go well, if I go home, I'm not here, and this is going to get done. I'm letting everyone else down. So, you, yes. you're there, you know, and then, and then, and then the sinister side of it is where that becomes factored into some project plan, yes, yes, the management yeah. thing, where it's like, well, okay, well, we know they'll do this, and I don't think, I don't think Rare did that deliberately. I think at Rare, it was just everyone had that kind of. I mean, the Stampers worked to that beat themselves; had always yeah. done so. Yeah, um, I think Tim Tim Wall says if you if you if you if you nine if you nine to five you get nine to five game. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, we had that to a degree with early seasons of EP as well yeah. as we yeah. were trying to define what a TV show about this stuff was, and we had you know all night editing time when we first started. It was six <laughs> at night to six in the morning was when we could actually edit the show with the the deal that we had back then. Uh, but I, I think what it is, is that you're when you're creating, you're pulling from your life and you're giving elements of your life into the creation. And that is just, it does take a toll, you know, and it, it, it isn't the same as sort of managing the expected, because what comes mm -hmm. out of creativity is the unexpected. And how do you plan for that? How do you yeah. know when an accident is going to happen that's going to lead to a discovery that's going to make your art stand apart and i know i know there's a lot more sophistication and sort of trying to understand that now based on years of study but even to this day studios still yeah. run into that that wall you know except now it's and, 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 hundreds uh, yeah. and hundreds of people and 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 it's not like building a wall if you're yeah. building a wall you get all the bricks you get all the right. cement ingredients you know that two men can build a wall in this amount of time. So if you have four, yeah. you could probably, yeah. it's scalable, it's predictable. Yeah. Yep. And 
again to pursue that analogy i would i've used this before i would say it was like building a wall if it's a game it's like someone comes along and says that's a really nice wall but can can it can it be over there it'd be much better yeah. over there yeah you know what? That's a okay, that's so a very we'll interesting look... analogy because when you look at the you know when I travel to London or lots of parts of the world and you look at the architecture of older buildings and older cities and and older structures, they're so ornate and artistic and mm -hmm. detailed. And I think that probably what happened over time is that people labored less over the craft and more over the the mass adoption of technology and had a much better mm. just in the physical sense they had a much better sense of how buildings should go up and how to keep things on schedule and time and budgets and timelines but that has made the world kind of more uniform and bland well, it's, it's 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 right dreadful homogeny now all skylines of yes. big cities yes the same. exactly <laughs> yeah and i bet people were crunching <laughs> building yeah. those yeah. those yeah. beautiful uh, you know, buildings that have stood up for hundreds and hundreds of years they were crying but then, but then and i'm not trying to justify crunch culture but it it is yeah. this but, but, interesting but kind get, of perspective yeah in, in 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 certainly in the uk if you look at i mean other places as well but like if you look at things like cathedrals and stuff yeah you get you get those like little easter eggs where you go and look and there's a there's a carved boss somewhere of some guy pulling his trousers down or whatever totally and, yeah and you know and if that was in the game, we'd be like, "Oh, it's amazing!" They put this amazing little yeah. Well, you yeah. know, these guys who who spent twenty years, forty years, the man and boy worked on this cathedral. They 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 found they found you know they found the energy to do these yeah. little expressive things yeah. to stamp yeah. their identity on it as well. And I th and then that's again, um, I loved working on smaller teams because that space. To be allowed to stamp your identity and to say I was here, yeah. It, it and and when you go into you know when you go into when you're when you're animator two hundred and five on something, yeah. I I feel no, for no, no. you know because there are lots of really fantastic jobs out there and some really amazing larger teams, but I certainly feel for for those people and I think about them all the time and I also think about the. Uh, the people that work on these perpetual games as well, these live service games where it's just these yeah. incremental yeah. additions. That's, but that's, that's, that's tough, that's, man. That's a new form of crunch. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, I, I can't imagine what that's like, you know, we, we, again, another, another, another thing from the cartridge generation and, and, and the, you know, any physical media generation was just that thing of the, it, it, it had an end to it. it yeah. You know, that brought its own pressures undoubtedly because it brought all of the pressures of quality control and stuff so actually you know the, the game's coming out here the game needs to be finished here so that we've got yeah. this period of time to yeah. get it so because we, somebody's going to go and pull the trigger and make a hundred thousand copies of this yeah and they can't be broken because we can't fix it so there's that and i think that was a great thing because i, I think for there's a lot of learning experience comes out of that kind of shipping cycle, but now people are in perpetual ship mode on things. Yeah. yeah. And that must just be, it's like, it's the, it's the Sisyphean task, isn't it? It's just, you're yeah. there and you're never going to get to the top of the hill. Yeah, and it translates back to the player too. You know, I, I worry that there are a lot of people that feel chained to their game because it doesn't yeah. end. It is a weird thing, and I don't know if this is a generational thing and what we were raised on and what you were building and I was reviewing and mm -hmm. consuming, but it is weird. And and I I like I love Helldivers too, but I went back mm -hmm. into it again, and it's like okay, I don't want to just play this, you know. Like I want to play other things, I you know. Play, and I yeah. also I I want to be able to go back to things that we create in this industry. Like it's such a treat to play Perfect Dark. It's such a treat mm -hmm. to re-experience Goldeneye to have perspective and life distance and and to and, go and, back and, 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 and appreciate and, yeah, and the see, art of yeah, it and and see and see the things which you know are dated as well because that's part of you know if you go and watch old cinema you know that's yeah. always that's interesting as well look at the pacing of old action films look at the how they open you know you you'll have something you, know, you go back to i can't remember, watch something the other day and i was just trying to explain to the, the kid I, was, I badgered the, the kids into watching it and they, yeah. they didn't they didn't stay with this I'm, i can't remember what it was but it started with 
the credits. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it was it was some music and just pages of here's these celebrating people. the people. Here's people. Yeah. Here's people. Yeah. And some music going on in the background. So when's, when's, when's the actual thing start? And then when it does start, <laughs> it doesn't start with sm- sl- slapping you in the face with this amazing action scene. It's got a slow burn to it. But then yeah. you look at that and say, so that's been lost as well because that pacing, I mean, again, that, that you, you mentioned, um, yeah, so like live service games, you know, that's if you look at what happened there, you know, that's those games like Fortnite, et cetera, et cetera, they're not designed to coexist with you doing playing other games. They want yeah. all off your time, all yeah. off the time. Right. It's, yeah. it's like signing up to some boot camp. And and you don't you don't see that at the start because the joy is there. The joy in the exploration is there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I've, I, I think there's, I mean, there are a lot of things about Fortnite which I think are amazingly, amazingly good. But I didn't play it. I, I went through a stage where I played it a lot. I I occasionally go and look at it now, but it's like it's 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 like someone's. It's the house where I used to live, and somebody else lives there now, and I I can't understand it. And I'm, you know, I go through a door expecting it to be a bathroom, and it's been turned into something else. And it's like yeah. now I'm, you know, I would you love a new old- trend of six hour games or ten hour games. Yeah. A triple A caliber where there's a beginning and an end. And I, you know, I don't know if that's the old grouchy game reviewer in me coming mm. out or whatever, but I just think that the um I think it would be healthy for the business for more of that. I, you know? I got my L- Molly a, a, it was about a month ago or something, and she she didn't have much she was didn't have much time. She was it was like she was gonna be going back to uni or something, and she was going, Oh, dad, are there any games? Bless her. She actually will listen to my. I I, I do have some authority. Yeah, you know, it'll be like you know, what what do you think I should play? And I I got her to play. Do you know the game A Short Hike? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, if you play that, that'll that play that. So we sat down and kind of first of all was like, I said, no, you need to get past this kind of slightly pixely kind of rendering thing that do do it. And yeah, it, and I and then and she played. It says, is it, can you think of anything else like that? Not immediately. <laughs> yeah. It should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's a little bite sized. It's like a movie experience. It's yep. it's it's a, and it doesn't have a sequel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's one and done. They did a beautiful little thing, you know, in in a in a very inviting world. Yeah, it's great that you bring that up. So, so going back to Perfect Dark, you knew that a new Juggernaut was coming through Rare, and did it feel the same? working on that game that it did on GoldenEye, or did it, did it feel a little bit different for you or, and the rest of the team? Because I know that what happened for you, spoiler alert, is you didn't stay with the game and you didn't yeah, stay yeah, with yeah, Rare. Yeah. You 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 yeah. left to start your own thing. Um, I, 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 I loved working on Perfect Dark. I loved writing the fiction. I, I, that was just, you know, and it was kind of, it was also, I mean, I still have um, a bunch of old, documents which and and it kind of again to what we were speaking about earlier it felt like a new um a new territory that we're exploring because you know we'd just gone through the process of making goldeneye and adapting a story to a game so we Mm -hmm. we knew what kind of things worked what kind of things so you know we went to perfect dark it was like well we we need we we need to have a a fiction that we're going to put in this game what but we're not just informed by all the sci-fi that we've liked all the other things in other media we like we actually have got now the experience and vocabulary of how you might put those things into a game so it becomes it's not taking this and adapting it it's Here's here's the law and the fiction. Here's the game, and it's a circular thing. Where if if we if this kind of a gameplay, we, we want to have like the Carrington Villa. That was like, why don't we have? We you know, we 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 had lots of corridors. We know we can do exteriors now to some extent. Why don't we build an environment where you're expected to be coming? And it's a kind of infiltration thing, where you see it from the outside. You're trying to learn what the guards are doing. We know these kinds of gameplay work. 
So we put that in the narrative. Um, like the data that I'm building at the start, that's the same, another thing. It's like, well, that building, you know, we, we've been doing all of these, like, game first-person shooters. They always end up, you know, it, the corridor shooter is always set underground mm -hmm. in some in some special lair or it's set in some um, spaceship that nobody knows yeah. the outside of it. So it doesn't, it doesn't need to behave like, no, nobody comes along and goes, well, spaceships aren't like that inside. It's like, no, yeah. you know, many corridors as you want. There's like a big corridor <laughs> snaking down here. But if you build, if you build a building like a tower block, like the office, the, that, that, that tower, tower, Lucerne tower, I think it was called in, in, in my notes. Um, and that was fun. Cause it's like, again, I think never happened. I one of the things we wanted to do there, or certainly I wanted to do when I saw that you could kind of do it, was that you could we had the idea that you might go outside the building and go around the outside. Ooh, There's that nice. big X, you yeah. slide down it and all that kind of stuff. And it just, you know, things that, that I think we all happen. tried that, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So 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 those kind of. I mean, and and that was that was. It was great, and and also you know we got to. I mean, there's, there's a, obviously there's a bit there's a bit of. I don't know. I mean, I think you know we were talking about Bond having that slight quirkiness to it. Yeah, the whole Elvis thing in Perfect Dark. It's like yeah, it, it's it's kind of being serious sci-fi, but it's got this silliness about it, which is which is, I think I think it's really good. It's kind of playful yep. and, and and light, and it and it can sit in there. I'm sure it's the kind of thing that if we had have had some external producers sitting over us it would have been no you don't do that do that won't sell don't are right. you sure you don't are you sure you don't right. want the male main character be male you know you, you, it's not too late to go back <laughs> that's <laughs> it, you know that's one of the cool things about rare as a company because it existed across time as well it existed as an a, a success in 8-bit and 16-bit and now we're moving into 3d game yeah. development but it always had a connection i remember jet force gemini was a really great example of that yeah, like the yeah. arcadey roots of that game made it really special it really connected a lot of dots for me as a player back yeah, then jet force blast core as well as I mean, totally yeah, there's, like there was a I, loopy kind of gamey yeah. attitude about it and perfect dark definitely had that but it also had all of the benefits of what you guys learned making bond and the uh the confidence of that too. You could feel the confidence. You could feel your team maturing into building something that was going to affect culture, something that was going to, from games, make a difference in in a lot of people's lives and in the world. And you did do that. Yeah. And and the I mean, I mean as you said, I left um, partway into it. Um, one of the things which I, I just enormous respect for. Mark Edmonds and, and 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 Duncan and and Brett Jones, who kept it going when I mean obviously quite a lot of the team left. You know that was yeah, it was like one of those radical surgeries wow. where we'll just we'll just yeah. cut half the brain away and see That's if we can crazy. make two people. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, how many people left? So there's myself and Steve, uh, Carl. Uh, Lee Ray and Graham Norgate. So there was five people who were on Perfect Dark team, and wow. and Martin had left anyway. Martin left to go and, and work at Nintendo, so that wow. the team lead left. So yeah, you know, pretty much it was more than half. It was more than half the Gold Knight team had gone. What a miracle uh, that game got finished! <laughs> like truly, yeah, what a miracle. But, um, but you know that's you know I mean, Rare always hired well, um, and. Like I said, I mean, there was a, there was a lot of experience by that by that time. Um, what was it like yeah. to play the game when it was done? It was very strange playing it when it was done. Sure, because I kind of I I, I came at the time I would have been really busy because we were you know we were working on Time Splitters Two, I guess, when it came out. I suppose it must have been. It didn't again was just. 24 7 doing stuff yeah um and i think i dipped into it but didn't i think i didn't really ever play it properly until i played like the the rare replay version of it interesting you know, I, I, I okay think, yeah you know, um because i yeah and, I, and 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 again it it was never a game that i played a lot of multiplayer on mm -hmm. certainly although one thing I would say about that is that the weapon design and, and 
that largely down to Duncan. The weapon design in Perfect Dark is, it, I mean, that's just a notch above. Nobody was doing that stuff. It's totally, like, you know, yeah. You know, I remember when we were, when we were doing like Future Perfect, um, particularly, you know, people on the team who were, you know, who were, you know, younger than I was, who were newer to the company, going, we can't do this. I said, well, yeah, that's really good. He says, Perfect Dark's got that. Said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nice one, yeah. Duncan. <laughs> you know, so you're being a new, you're, it's like that weird, but it's amazing to then be, you know, that that's, you know, to be here looking back over there, looking at what your old colleagues have done and totally, you know, respecting the quality of it and, and yeah. also realizing, well, we've got to, we've got to step up. Um, well, you did do that with Time Splitters. Also, another phenomenal. I mean, God, I, a game maker is lucky to have one, and you've had several really big franchises. Time Splitters was something from your brain, or how did that sort of come into formation? No, so, 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 Time Splitters came about um, when we left Rare and set up Pre Radical. The project that we were pitching to publishers was called Redemption. The working mm. title was Redemption, and it was basically it was the story that became Second Sight. That um, so it was this long, you know, a proper. I mean, I that was the thing. I'd got, I'd gone away and thought, okay, well, we, we need to, we, you know, Dave, you put the story stuff in the other games. What's going to be the thing? I mean, other, others others contributed to it, but it was largely me just kind of like beavering away on a story. Yeah. Um, and we'd started to so IDOS, uh, and it was going to be first person as well. It was going to be a first person. Kind of, it's kind of, it's almost like, I don't know. It was, it, we were probably going to try and make something which was a bit like Bioshock, I suppose. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> you, yeah, because yeah, there are there are similarities in the in 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 the kind of it's got gunplay and it's got psychic powers and that kind of stuff. Um, so we'd started making that. So started making the tech. Um, but, you know, when we started, we were like five, you know, five people. So and we were like trying to hire people and you know, that was a slow process. Um, Steve had absolutely hammered it and got stuff running on PlayStation 2 dev kit really, really quickly. Cool. Um, so this was kind of like the beginning 2000, I suppose. No, 99, 99. No, 99, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and we were kind of also when, yeah, on paper, it was like, oh, we'll make a game. We'll take three years. We'll build a company, make a game. That's our plan. And then you start doing it and you're kind of going, yeah, but we, we yeah, it might take longer than three years to make the thing that we're, we're saying we're making here because we've got to get all these other things working. Also, you know, that's a long time in the landscape. So it was like, is this something we can do more quickly to prove that we can make something? Um, and at the same time, Sony were going, how come you guys have got this first person engine up and running really, really quickly when other people have had these dev kits for ages and they haven't? That's great. So we went back to IDOS and said, okay, what, what about this? What about we don't do the story game that we pitched you? What about we just do a multi like a, a, a first person arcade shooter and we hang it on the multiplayer? So it was called MPG, multiplayer game. We went back and said, let's not do redemption, let's do MPG, multiplayer game. Yeah. And they said, no, no, you're not doing that. You're doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing. Um, and we 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 then started doing that instead. We we quietly your kind team of, of five we, splintered. Yeah, into... <laughs> well, yeah. Well, we knew we we knew that because because Sony uh, also PlayStation Two release date had slipped. Yeah, it was supposed to be it, it, it moved back by like almost a year. I can't remember how much, but it was what an incredible it, piece of technology too, right? Like coming from PS One and N sixty four, that PS Two was freaking powerful, man. Yeah. It had well, so I mean, many build yeah. levels. Yeah, yeah. And yeah it was. It was. It was. I mean, it was. I mean, it, 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 I think it's, I mean, again, I mean, most, it's funny, they, looking back, those early cons, most, most of the early console generations, you could put your finger on something, each one and go, this is innovative because of this. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, kind of now we're caught up in this is innovative because of 
um, I don't know, because it costs $500 again. Because <laughs> it's faster. Because <laughs> it's faster. It loads quicker, yes. It's faster. It loads quicker. You can have bigger games and less yeah. off them for more money. <laughs> um, so, yes, and, and, and then also the DVD thing. I mean, PlayStation 2 just, I mean, the, the, that you already had something which was going to be compelling, and then it was like, and you can watch DVDs. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So that was the you know that that anyway. So we we then we started, went and started making time splitters, and and then time splitters was you know the design for time splitters was why don't we just do as much of the kind of shit that we'd like in games to be in this game as quickly yeah. as we possibly. Yeah. So you know the characters. I mean Ben Newman was our main character artist. Ben just build a whole bunch of wacky characters. And 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 we kind of had a thing. It's like, well, it should. Why don't we just steal movie genres? So we'll steal crime and crime kind of action, um, sci-fi, horror, and then we'll do them in different time periods, so that we can make an even bigger rod for a back. Um, and and that's what the first and and that and that. But that time split is one dev cycle was 18 months from the day we Holy started Holy crap. From, from the day we started the company with five people in a, wow. in a, in a rental office. <laughs> and you know that building a game and building a company are two separate companies in a way, yeah, right? It, like it's they're two different jobs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it really is. Yeah. That's amazing. How long did it take to make GoldenEye? Um, so I was... I think the dev cycle for Golan was like three and a half years or something. Um, that, to I put it in honest. context, yeah, but, but yeah, but but again, also that was you know that was I, I prototyping was and building the concept and yeah, and and, yeah. and also making a game for hardware that didn't exist, etc., cetera, right. etc. Cetera. Making a three D yes. game when nobody had ever made a three D game before, yes. Making a game where you didn't know that the controller was going to have a stick on it. So freaking ambitious, and then Perfect Dark loses half its team, and which so is why it, which is why it took longer to make. Because yeah, got, yeah, right. It, it, well, I mean, little did you guys know that you were, you know, it it, it was all in the sort of northern English in, part of in, in, in the in in the Midlands. So Free Radical Midlands. was in 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 Nottingham. Um, uh, rare isn't twice cross, so it's not very far away. It's near near. near so it, you're time. building some seminal first person shooter action out of this area, you know, like you're defining it for the big the world in a lot of ways. Well, that was all, so but cool. that was also the case, also the case with rare. I mean, rare was it was a farmhouse with international level teams competing with each other. Wild, you know that that's you know, we weren't we often joke if we if. if when we meet up and we're doing like panels and stuff, people ask what, what was like at rare. It's like, well, who you know, who were you keeping an eye on? So we were keeping an eye on the guys in the other barn because we we, we weren't so interested good. in what people were doing in Japan, or we wanted to beat those guys. We want to do something better than those guys. Do. That's great. <laughs> That's amazing. So Time Splitters, um, I, I I love that game, and I loved the uh, Time Splitters too as well, and I. Um, I have this thing like I love Time Crisis as well, the the old mm -hmm. Namco shooter, and one of my favorite old classic arcade games is Time Pilot. And I just right. there's somebody should just take all three of those uh, <laughs> IP and, and make something mind blowing with it. I just I love this idea of jumping through time and keeping that action and uh, you know they're being connective tissue, but it's just a different vibe. You know, it's so arcadey. To yeah. think We'd of say, yeah, it's, it's, new it's levels. a very okay, yeah, very arcadey game, and you always yeah. have the kind of fresh and familiar things going on, you know, and and then you know I, we kind of inadvertently because it wasn't ever it was just because we started doing all these characters, it's like suddenly we like like the um, you built a Tons universe one has the well uh, the, yeah you yeah well that we were building a kind of cinematic universe of stuff. <laughs> Of, of the multiverse, you were, yeah, we were totally. building, a, building a multiverse. We didn't, yeah. Um, and 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 I mean, Time Splitters one. It's people can say, "Well, I didn't have any story." I said, but it, but it did have story because each each of the little things you go into, the yeah, little world you go into, they've got an implicit, yep. yep. They're characters in a world that they belong in doing a thing. Yep. It just happens yep. that you jump into it. 
Um, it, and it was, was a kind of, successful game, man. Like it was yeah. a real, like I got it playing it back then. And, yeah. you know, another seminal piece of, of uh, interactive storytelling, although EA didn't know it was what they were doing with SSX and all the characters that they were that, throwing yeah, in there. Like yeah. they, they were implying this threaded kind of like value mm. to all of these different links and it was very similar in this game especially yeah. when we're looking at a thing at the fidelity that time splitters was as well like it was a massive leap in terms of production quality and what was rendered on screen for us as players like it was incredible yeah. that that transition you know, I, I, from that at that generation i i think i think particularly i mean time splitters 2 i is is that time splitters 2 was probably the easiest development cycle i've ever been involved in because that's amazing we we we, we did ts1 we hit that playstation 2 launch date in europe which was a massive achievement so the, the company was like well these guys can do it we got a bunch of experience together we kind of knew what by the time we'd shipped time splitters 1 we realized what the game we were trying to make was <laughs> Which was yeah. time splitters too. So yeah, we immediately yeah. went into making it, kind of barely skipped a beat. Um, and there's just a bunch of well, one of the things that really sticks with me looking back at it is I love the cutscenes in Time Splitters 2. Yeah. The little book ending cutscenes. Because they they're incredibly well animated and directed. Um, and that was largely down to James Cunliffe, who was a kind of head animator for them. They were really hard to make. They were technically an absolute ball ache to make because all of that facial animation stuff, it just didn't exist. I remember yes. we... Yes, um, was it the, 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 the Sony guy who's just left? Um, Jack? Jack? What? Oh, it was Jim. Jim Ryan. Jim yes. Ryan. Yes. Okay, yes, Jim yeah, Ryan. yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And we, I remember going with... We had a demo of TS2 with the damn level with that intro cutscene with the, you know, the, the, the two guys with the torch... In the in the in in the, and, the, and, the, and the zombie kind of like jumps out on them, and I remember taking that to um, Sony America uh, with some other people, and they we just knew we were doing stuff which was we were like punching so far above our weight because we were doing something. They were looking at it going, "This is great. How did you do? What, what did you use to do this?" Well, we just made our own stuff and did it. It's like that's great. Okay. Um, but yeah, so and 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 that game, you know, it it's yeah, it's I think it still stands up really, really well. The map maker stuff and things on it was, I mean, that was again, that was a kind of passion thing that to to have a, a a game creation tool in the game. Yeah, you no, know, every each of those three games, the publishers wanted us to cut that because it was just seen as being, you know, this is overly ambitious. You won't, you know, make the game. Don't try and make two games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah it, it, it's a, it, it's amazing how how uh, innovative that whole experience was, and also the lessons that I think you were learning, but showing the rest of the development community as well. Like it was a very public thing that you had left Rare and and other team members had left Rare. You were starting your own thing, and I, you know what's prevalent now and what's what people are aware of now are like Free Radical was brought back again mm. and you guys were working on time splitters and i'm sure this is incredibly raw but uh there's been so much carnage across the game industry and unfortunately free radical was mm -hmm. was part of that carnage what, can you take us into kind of what happened and and how was it handled and and uh and I what mean, happens it's, now it's, i mean well uh you know i mean the, the you know the original Free Radical went under, we were working, you know, so after Time Split was Future Perfect, we worked with Ubisoft on 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 Haze, which, I mean, that was, it's it's funny looking back at that time now, nobody wanted to make Time Split as 4 then. We wanted to make Time Split as 4, no publisher yeah. wanted to make it. And we just constantly had, one of the things was it's like, nobody wants quirky nonsense. Yeah, yeah. You know, the demographic for shooting games is is militaristic kids who just want to shoot things, and it's like right. okay, Call of Duty, yeah, and and, and uh, yeah, Call of Duty. I mean, and 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 we constantly had this, you know. Again, we went through it with with EA. It's like time splitters. What what's the X? What's the unique selling point about your thing? 
So well, right. you'd excel the point out it is a variety. Now you can have variety. Oh. Uh, well mm. it's fun. No, we can't have fun. Look, people <laughs> like it. It reviews well. It sold lots of copies. No. None none of those is an X. It's just like <laughs> Game well, I mean, like that's it. it's. It, I'm not trying to throw shade at EA, but that's pretty clear on because look at all the licenses that they have, all the properties yeah. that they have, and they just yeah. don't serve them up again. Like it's insane that we don't have a new SSX or a new Road Rash well, yeah, or a well, new they, Burnout. But they, but they went, they went, they went through a really strange period of being yeah. um, incredibly innovative again, like with you know Dead Space. Um, mm-hmm. They did, they did that Dante game. I mean, that's that 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 was great. Uh, that absolute mental. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> um, and anyway, um, so yeah, so I hadn't been making games from. I mean, that was like two thousand eight or something. I mean, we were that sort of thing. We 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 got seduced to the dark side. And we went went to, went. We we'd always said we we should only make our only always make your own thing. Always make your own thing that you own because that's yeah. that's your building. And don't do licensed stuff. And then it was like we had the opportunity to work in Star Wars, and that was everyone's going, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Battlefront, yeah. yes, oh yeah." So, yeah. We did, so the, yeah, and 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 there, I mean, we got caught up in a whole bunch of stuff. We got caught up in just a worldwide recession. I think we got caught up in Lucasfilm selling itself to Disney mm. because that's that's you know they, they they went through. I mean, Lucas Lucas the Lucas Empire didn't just destroy us. It destroyed LucasArts at the same time. It totally. Just, you know, yeah. Because they had this thing. It's like, what does that, what does that thing do? It makes games. Is that really predictable? Like the movie, the movie, no, it's, it's like 10 times more unpredictable. It, it's than you very think it is, even when you know it's yeah. unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> going, well, let's get rid of that. That's just a cash. And now they're going right back into it again. Now yeah. they are. Yeah, I know. Well, that, well, that, well then they're sitting around going, how come everybody else is making money off our license? Yes, and it'll be a cyclical thing. Give them, yeah. give them another five years, and you know, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Steve, Steve Ellis, um, you know, partner of Free Radical. Um, he, he, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's done. I mean, I when when the when the whole embrace of Free Radical thing blew up, I didn't really want to say anything about it. Because it's kind of Steve's story. I mean, Steve Steve had got back with them mm. when they got the IP, and they'd asked him to do something. So we, you know, um, and it's I don't know. I mean, it, it, the uh, I mean, yeah. To summarize, we had you know, it was funded to set up a studio to make a new Time Splitters game. Um, when Embracer got into financial difficulties, we were part of the the. the Night of the Long Knives, which kind of like going around cutting back on all their costs and stuff. I think so it got canned again. Um, the the best things about it were getting to build a new team of young talent. I mean, that was how we built Free Radical was with largely people. It was, you know, maybe the second job or their first job in the industry. Yeah. So people who were, you know, you, you want, you want good creative people who aren't jaded about what they're doing. Um, mm-hmm. you know. So, and, and you were think, doing that again, and we were doing that, and it's slow, yeah, you know, because people have to learn, and you know the technology is changing and stuff. So the, all of that was, and I think, I mean, looking forward, what I what I've said to people who were involved with it is, I just want to go and see what you guys go and do next. Wherever, yeah. because you know you're talented people you, you you didn't get to ship a game doing this but you got to work with other talented people and i think some bonds were made and and you know, friendships and stuff so let's go and see what they do um it's again it's 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 the collision between you know the things about games which are unpredictable and not knowable making them and then somebody trying to put it into some cookie cutter financial yeah. model. And yeah. it was an ambitious, I mean, you know, I'm not going to be openly massively critical of people, but I mean, Embracer's plan there is strange, was strange. <laughs> you know, somehow, somehow there'll be with, 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 with no slack or misfires, we'll just start doing this. So we buy all these IPs and we get all this dev and we get this money and we just put it together and we yeah. turn the oven on and we set the timer and magic 
it will happen reliably on a schedule. I, I do applaud that they were looking at awesome IP like Time yeah. Splitters and lots of other titles that they had been trying to invest like in. Kill to all bring humans. Back. I mean, the, yeah, there, there, there yes. are things there that, 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 yeah, there are success. There are successes there, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think we just weren't allowed enough, you know, not allowed, but you know, the circumstances where we weren't allowed enough time to cook. Yeah. So we were still, we were still at that stage where it doesn't look like a cake. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it looks so, like it looks like somebody's been breaking eggs and <laughs> throwing flour around the kitchen. <laughs> How big did the team get to? It was, I think, it was about eighty people. Oh wow! Um, yeah, wow. Yeah, so, it takes a lot of people to make a game in twenty twenty four, doesn't it? It takes a lot of people, and and also a lot of the stuff we were doing was, you know, it was people, obviously people upskilling. Um, it was it was being built over COVID as well, so there was the yeah. COVID disruption at the start of it. Right. Um, we were building it in UE five, which is a big, you know, that's you know, the that's, curve. That's, that's 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 a big curve, and and there's a lot of stuff. I mean, we we prototyped some stuff, but we were also building systems which we knew would be robust for like a three year dev cycle. But that doesn't yeah. look that doesn't look like final content. That looks like you're not doing anything. Yeah, it, look, it looks like yeah, you're running and, and, and going nowhere. And and thinking about how ambitious a, a modern time splitters game would have to be, you know, to uh, yeah, you know yeah. accurately so, I mean, and, represent and, and, all these different time periods and everything. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I want that game so bad. Yeah. There's the visual fidelity. <laughs> I mean, also, yeah. I mean, one thing I, I would be happy to say something about. Is, I mean, there was there were, there were some leaks. We were working on something which was, again, in the kind of pathfinding was. Fortnite style, mm. in in that it was going to be happen on a, it was going to be happening on a world which had many worlds in it, which is how you would encapsulate. I mean, I, I won't go further than that. Um, yeah, I think that was that was an int- yeah that was a good idea. I think the, the things that became clear. I mean, things that became clear was you're not going to be able to compete with Fortnite. Like I said earlier. Also, those games suck the air out of the room for everyone else. So you can only, they do. You can yeah. only have one. There can be only one. It's like Highland. I know. It's like, there is no top only... 50 live service game no, no. list. You know? <laughs> so, so, so we we actually, you know, we'd, we'd gone down that route, but it, it wasn't it wasn't like a one-way door because we were building we were building gameplay systems which would work in different configurations in different so types cool. of games. So that's that's that that was fine. And and then in, in the latter part of it, we had pivoted to basically realizing. Well, it was kind of what Steve and I had wanted to do at the start, which was to, which was to reinvent Time Splitters Two, yeah, as a jumping off point. Um, and we had some we had some new law, we had some old law, we had tied things together, loads of nice stuff. Um, it just you know, it's a shame. I mean, it didn't, yeah, it didn't. And it's kind of, I think, where it's got left now. I mean, Steve has kind of publicly said he thinks it'd be hard for him to go back to. I think I'd find it hard as well now because yeah. it's, it, you know, to have kind of raked over the ashes of something and then got excited about it again. And then yeah. it's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe it, 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 I'd, I'd be happier watching someone else go somewhere with it and maybe, you know, with, 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 with a blessing or some input or, you know, but yeah. not to be, doing it some you know, consulting or something like that yeah um so it is embracers still I, have the rights to everything or yeah do they yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they do no, no, okay no, no, they, 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 well they they when I mean, they they bought it all from from crytech um, yeah because crytech had it after free radical went under so right yeah, yeah. do you have uh a, a a drive to build another team or another studio or what are you thinking for yourself now i <laughs> You don't have I, to. I, I'm just asking. No, no, no. I mean, I, no, I mean it's, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's a, it, one of the things which is strange. I mean, particularly about, I mean, I'd say like my role is, it's, you know, game design is something that I, I think it's, it, 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 particularly when you, when when it meets the commercial side of stuff. And kind of you know big business, they don't really see value in individuals. 
Mm-hmm. So the you know the idea you know it's like the idea that I would be some kind of directorial auteur who might have something useful to say is just doesn't fly. You know? Yeah. Unless you're Hideo Kojima, then then, then it flies really well. <laughs> yeah. But, it, but it's, a, it's it's a, it's a you know it's a weird thing. It's like and 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 again. I don't know. I, I I don't know whether it's because if it's something that you do and you and you've demonstrably done it well and you understand it, then you probably don't. When people ask you what you do, you just go by well, just improvise using yeah. my best best intuition, and then they go, "Yeah, really? That doesn't sound like a talent." It's <laughs> um, problem solved. Yeah, problem solved. You know. Um, and and I think also it's like it's like when you get, I think if you've done a lot of it, um, you just take a lot of things for granted, and 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 we're well not not take things right, but you don't you know you'll 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 be making decisions about stuff that people that people don't see. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, an example actually to draw on the kind of like more recently performing the live music and stuff and things is like with with like like Grant and, and, and Dave Wise, Grant Kirk and Dave Wise. People don't say, oh let's I'll just do the music. They they get a professional composer to do the music. Right. I, I think with things like design, that that happens. It's like, oh you know, those, those guys, those you know, the, the, those producers or those people, those people who like games, they're probably they'll probably be good at making them. Yeah, but you wouldn't say those people. Those people who, yeah, those people who really like Frank Zappa's music, they'd probably be quite good at playing it. Yeah. Um. So there's something, you know, I I don't know. I mean, I, I think there is some, you know, there's there, there's there's a mismatch in perception of what people do mm-hmm. in 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 what what I've done in my career. Um. Yeah, and there's a there is this, and it, we talked touched on this a little bit, but there is this dehumanization that is happening around development, around and and what we're allowed to understand about the people that are building all of this thing, these things, as AI is sort of entering into the marketplace, which is going to further entrench this idea mm. that that jobs and roles and and assets and things can be you know, left to machines to cre- to create. But at the same time, companies as large as PlayStation and company heads as, as formidable as Phil Spencer are out there um, questioning the scale that games are at right now and how much mm-hmm. they cost and how much pressure it is to build something that is going to shake the earth and uh, satisfy all quadrants it's really tough. And I think that there is this growing appetite. And I'm seeing news reports and articles about the resurgence of, of um, retro playing, like for younger players as well. Mm-hmm. A lot of younger players are, you know, maybe through things like Roblox and whatever that are pulling from retro. Yep. Younger players are sort of evolving to have an interest in the simpler days of game making. And in that may exist an opportunity. And uh, who knows if it comes from, you know, these events that you're traveling to with your colleagues and friends and things, maybe something erupts out of there where you guys collaborate on something smaller well, that's me, still I, yeah, I mean, is I, I, profound. I, as I said, I mean, I, I, working in small teams is 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 very a very invigorating thing to do. Totally. Um, and and it's, a, <laughs> it's like it was like um Kind of parallel is like look Woody Allen films. Woody Allen always did this thing of he just had a bunch of people that he liked working with, and then they would all come back together and they would do a project, and then they all go off again. Um, yeah, does it mean that you know it, it, the the idea of doing that in a game? But the thing about games, I mean, it's just it's there is so much material now. I mean, that must be. I mean, when you like to 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 to, to fall, fall back to your the electronic playground stuff, you know, you look at those shows, and over the course in 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 the in the nineties, over the course of a year, there probably were I don't know a dozen twenty games off note, mm-hmm. and anyone who and and that was across genres, so anyone working in games. I mean, if you wanted to stay completely 
up to speed and au fait with everything that was coming on in the space, you probably had to play 20 games. And, and, and it might be an ice hockey game. It might be an RPG. It might be something else, whatever, you know. Yeah. And 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 you, I used to play football games. I, I don't yeah. soccer. I mean, I don't really like soccer that much. But I used to play soccer games because it was a valid games. place to look for inspiration and understand the technology and everything. Yeah. Now, I mean, you know, while we've twenty games of note probably came out while we were doing this interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, maybe, maybe, yes maybe, and maybe. no. Yeah. Yeah. Because there yeah. are there there are more that come out. It's tougher to find. It is, discoverability is an issue, and there's yeah. there's yeah. Um, a value proposition, you know, that's very challenged and different. Like the the uh, constraints of shipping games were much clearer back in the '90s and the 2000s. But um, there's, I mean, there's good. There there is always good work, but you know, it's not overwhelming in terms of scale of of cool things at the end of a year. And we've had some highlight years 20 years ago that are still fondly remembered. I think when we got to the PS3 and 360 era, it was kind of like before internet distribution and cell phones and digital distribution and, 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 mm -hmm. uh, uh, microtransactions and all of that stuff really kind of took a foothold in, in, or a toehold in the video game industry where th stuff was still physicalized. Yeah. But developers had evolved to a point where they were very, very savvy and the technology was really good. So it could really kind of hit the imagination that the developers had. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think back to the PS3 360 era and it's pretty remarkable, uh, you know, the amount of software and the amount of good software at the AA and AAA mm -hmm. level. Um, and it was really beautiful work to present on television. Now we have much more beautiful looking experiences, but there are bigger investments. There are fewer of them um, at that scale and they're less risky, as you mentioned I, at the I, beginning. I, but, yeah. but, but those big, I, I don't even play those big games. I don't have the time to play them. Yeah. And, and yeah. I've, I've other things I'd rather be be doing. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's 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 weird because I mean, you know, in, in my lifetime, it's gone from you know when I when I when I was, you know, little, I guess you know, like um, young teenager, um, playing like Spectrum games and stuff, and going playing arcade stuff. You you couldn't get enough of it. You your your appetite would voraciously consume yes. everything you could get your yes. hands on. Yes, and and. The idea that now I mean, I've got a Steam Deck with probably 400 games on it. Yeah, I've got games I've bought I've never played. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other thing about games now too. And you're bringing up an excellent point: is that old games are still valuable, and the mm. industry doesn't know that. You know, Nintendo does, I think, to a degree, and you know, Xbox is saying the right things with their backwards compatibility, and they're doing some really great things, and Sony's offering some of the back catalog and stuff. But it, they're still valuable. They're still really fun to play. And so you can load mm. up a Steam Deck and be overwhelmed. But it's not just on this year's titles. It's on stuff that, yeah, that's yes, come out years and years yeah. ago. Well, but that, but yeah. that's, that's before I go and have everything emulated on it. And then I've got tens of thousands of, <laughs> of, of titles available. Yeah, that will over, overwhelm people for yeah. sure. Yeah, and, and but, but I mean, the, the, things, the things that I play that I really, I, I just love new work fresh work like, yeah. i mean recently i mean a game that came out recently when it's already popular that bellatro that that poker game yes the card game yeah and 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 you look at it and it's it's like so there's not really any technical reason that that game couldn't be made 30 years ago mm -hmm. it's not it's not you know there are some things about you know but but actually the 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 set of game design rules that are in play there, they just hadn't been discovered. And, and, and then there's a thread, the thread that's led to those, it's come from board games when you had like deck building, like, you know, like Dominion and Ascension and stuff and things. And that collect, you know, board game deck building, winnowing stuff has, has evolved over the last, I guess that's probably about 15, 15 years or something. I can't remember when Dominion came out. So like yeah. 2000s. Um, and then 
it's got it, 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 it's it's got this really playful proposition where it's like, well, actually, you can take something which is poker, where people know people, even people who don't play poker, know what poker hands are like. Yes. So you've got this this framework which is already Im- embedded in your head, and then you add this thing to it, which is the, the you know the the deck manipulation, but then it's got the, the joke anyway, all that kind of stuff. Amazing game. Amazing innovation. I mean, everyone's now trying to make copies of it. But other things like um, a couple of years ago, Baba is you. That kind oh, of that little, was great. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, did you play Dave the Diver last year? Yes. Or yes, have you played yeah. that beautiful game as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Loop Hero. That was a crazy one. A couple of years. Very ago. cool That's game. Crazy. Yeah. Cocoon yeah. so, was and, excellent and he, as well. Yeah, uh, but all these, yeah. all these, you know, and and it's actually. They're really exciting because it's not just a, another triple A third person shooter with yes. some escort missions in it or something. I mean, I, I did you play like, Marvel Spider Man Two from Insomnia? No, I haven't. I haven't played it. No. Uh, did you? Did you I have played, you played any of the Spider Man? I, I, play, I played some of the. Uh, yeah, I've played some of the. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I mean that's so that's an example. Where I'm probably lazily going. Oh, it's probably just like the other ones. Um, well, it. It, it is in in its um, you know in, in its sort of play of swinging and and mm-hmm. prime busting and all of that stuff. But one of the things that I really loved about that game is the uh, this beautiful interweave of storytelling and narr- you know narrative work going right into exciting over the top cinematic action yeah. and just the power of what the new machine can offer and and Insomniac really kind of pushing its its creative juices to build something really i mean it, there's a reason why it costs so much to make it's all up on there on, on screen but it's also really accessible i think for anyone that is curious about what games can mean now in well, 2020 that, well that thing that thing oh, that, that very very rarely happens in games but what it's done is incredibly powerful is as you're saying it's like how you know you, know, you, you essentially you will have a story which is not it's predetermined, mm-hmm. but the actual act of walking, walking the game, or whatever you want to call it, I mean, going through the game, it gives you a feeling of connection which you would n- never get from any other media. I mean, it's, yeah, you, know, you can, you. I mean, I, I love reading, and I, I think that you know that books often can get you close to that, but they don't give you the ownership. Of the moment that that games do exactly and one of the yeah. one of the, the the best example I ever felt of it is in that um, that brothers game that right to, yeah we have one game. on each thumbstick yeah. yeah yeah so you play the game and you get used to this kind of like patting your belly rubbing you rubbing your whatever way around it is anyway and 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 this intimate connection between these two characters all right david's about to drop a big spoiler for brothers a tale of two sons so if you want to play that game and you don't want to hear this spoiler skip ahead by one minute and nine seconds and then there's a part at the end of it where one of them has died spoilers sorry yeah and 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 it feels like you've lost i don't know it's like to lose a limb but it feels the the sense of loss is incredible because you're still you're still manipulating this ghost control and and I remember trying to describe it to people who don't play games, and so I, I can't describe this to you because you don't. It's not like watching a film. It's not like reading a book. It's like there's a thing has happened there, and you are so sucked in. And part of it also is the time that you've spent. I mean, we're, we're talking about games should be shorter, but you know, if you've sunk five hours into some story where you've, you know, you you, you you've had the moments of joy and triumph and the moments of despair. You are massively invested in those characters, yes, and 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 that and that's why it hits home so strongly whenever they succeed or fail in in in, in, so, in some in some big way. Um, although, the, I mean, the flip side of that, I mean, that, uh, I, I, like, yeah, you know, how many times does Sony need to remake The Last of Us? <laughs> <laughs> Well, clearly a, a transmedia juggernaut that borrows from uh, you know yeah. a lot of beautiful work before it and crystallizes it for for games. No, it, but it, yes, it, also it, a, a monetary low hanging fruit. But it's it's you know it's it it, it 
it's it's such a weird thing, isn't it? Because I mean, the first one, it's it's like I I loved the first one. I've tried yes. to go back and play the other ones, and I just it's just, I'm going to bounce off it because I think I'll go and do something. Why not go and read a d- different story in a different book or watch a different film or something? Oh, and they really um, fumbled the ball with the the PC release and it not really sort of working for the Steam Deck when they released it on mm-hmm. PC that first one. Um, but I think again, like some great stuff. But I was thinking about this, and this totally plays into what we're talking about here. It, it, Naughty Dog has this beautiful history of selling PlayStations with this mm. proliferate collection of games. They had the Jack and Daxter and the Crash Bandicoot yeah, yeah. on PS3. They gave us three Uncharted games and The Last of Us. They gave us four games. They gave us, I think, just Uncharted 4 on and The Last of Us 2 on mm. PlayStation 4. We're like, I don't know, three, four years into the PS5. We haven't got a Naughty Dog game yet. We're gonna we're gonna be lucky but, but, if we but, get but one. That's, but that's but that's because the whole cadence of the making those assets and complexity it's it's yeah. it's not it's not linear even it's like you're mm-hmm. it's like some RPG level up. It's like now you need to get ten times as much content to get to the next level. <laughs> yeah, I know um, I it's mean, surreal. So yeah, um, and 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 I mean, I'm not ragging on it. PlayStation Five is the first console I haven't bought. Yeah, because I couldn't get one, and that kind of annoyed me. So I was like, "Yeah, well, I'm not going to get that." And then some <laughs> games came out. I was like, "Well, but I, you know, I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather go and if I, if I go and 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 spend fifty dollars buying a smattering of indie titles on Steam Deck, then I at least know that some passionate people have seen some of that reward." <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. You know. Uh, yeah, and that is definitely a, a, a reality in game making today is that there's a lot of different directions uh, of like great choices. You know, mm-hmm. there is a lot of really different ways that you can go. And and uh, in terms of whatever hardware you pick up and, and whatever th- thing you sign up for, whether it's the Steam yeah. store or you are a big uh, Nintendo fan and you pick up the Nintendo Switch online thing and you can play all the classic games, including your beloved GoldenEye. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you know what strikes me is, is you were defining that where we're at now. You didn't know what you were doing with these huge, you know, way yeah, yeah. bigger than, than achievable, ambitious games and interweaving story into complex mm. 3D design. It's your fault, David. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you, you were show you were batting above you know yeah. the, the average and you were showing but, people but, what could but, be done yeah. and you inspired so many people man but, it's but, amazing. What was, but what was so exciting about doing it then was that there was no you weren't looking over your shoulder at what somebody else had done it was right. just it was virgin territory yeah so it was phenomenally it was just, I just, it was, it was great making. I mean, it's hard work, it was, but it was great making God because we could, we again with the agility of the small team as well. I think I've said before is you could think of something in the morning and you could have tried it out by the time you went home. Although the time you went home was probably twelve o'clock <laughs> midnight, but you could do that iteration, and 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 that's again, I always, I mean, that's another thing which is which which collides with the business and the money yeah is the way to make good games is to iterate on something and find that you you can't find you can't find the fun with a blank piece of paper and 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 a pencil no you got to play it you got to play it you got to feel it yeah. because that's the, that's what the medium is it it's 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 the tangibility and you know you can you can think of amazing ideas and rule sets and stuff and it can fall flat on its face or you could be doing something where you've got some very, very banal things. You go, actually, this does this, and this does this. Has anyone ever connected this to this? Yeah. And you try it, and it's like, oh, that, that's really good fun. Um, and then when someone says, can you, you know, can you can you write me a game design document and write me a costing and spec for how yeah. you're going to make this thing? It's like, no. Yeah. I, I when when Back in the free radical days, we'd constantly get asked about game design documents and constantly be explained that we didn't really use them. We, you know, we would try to, if there was something that was worth writing down to communicate that you're going to have to explain over and over again, yes, you might write it down, um, but better to actually do it in the game. 
And people say, why do you write game design documents? And I said, well, if, if I if I could write a game design document that you could then go and make a hit game with, I would be in the game design document writing business. I'd mm-hmm. just write these and sell them. I'd sell them ten million dollars a pop, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I wouldn't have to. Then I wouldn't have to do the pop. You make it because you could go and make it. It's like well, right. that's that's why it's hard to do because it's you know, and and it gets it gets more predictable with some things. I mean, you've done something; it's a, a sequel or a remaster or something. Then obviously yes. there's an enormous amount of predictability. But yes. I think you know, for innovation, you can't schedule innovation. You can't. It's it's truly making the roads as you're making the map, mm-hmm. and it, you have to feel that the road is working. Yeah, it's beautiful, David. I'm really looking forward to whatever you're working on next. You know, and come, I love come, that come, you're come and see us play in concert. <laughs> I, that's what I think is beautiful. I think that you're in this celebration mode right now, and yeah. you're you're getting um, you know, this this tactile sense of community and and getting a, a sense of how many people's lives you've impacted and i think that's all beautiful and i'm excited to see where you, you celebrate that but also to see what comes out of that because i feel like there is this this uh this next thing that we're going to be surprised by from david doke um and well, you, I, well, I, you can't i, I mean if you, if you enjoy creating you can't stop creating i mean it's you it's, can't you know you can't this has been an incredible treat for me. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being in the basement with me. This is amazing. Uh, and I know we've just scratched the surface. And, you know, what I've been struck by talking with you is that I need to assemble a little collection of of veterans. And we should um, pick the topic and get into it with a bunch mm. of different voices. And so I'll, I'll reach out again. But uh, I know that many fans of GoldenEye and Perfect Dark and Time Splitters and everything that you've been a a part of are going to love listening to all of this uh so thank you for being here and thank you for watching and thank you for listening if you are listening to this on the audio podcast we also record all of these things for video on our youtube channel youtube.com slash epn tv and that's where you can watch classic episodes of the electric playground as well as all of our new stuff we premiere fresh episodes from our seasons we've started with the first three episodes already Uh, every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific, and you can come and watch them, and and they're premiered, so people are in the chat. And David actually jumped into the chat the other day, which was such a thrill. That was amazing. But thank you, my friend. Thank you for being here, and thank you all for tuning into Vic's Basement. We will see you soon, and until then, play forever. Play forever.